This is all very familiar to Boston, massive construction projects changing the face of the city. But not since the back bay was filled in or the city's subway system built has there been anything like what's about to happen. In the next decade, billions of dollars will be spent to change all this. Boston's central artery will move underground. A third tunnel will snake under the harbor to Logan Airport. At the same time, a treatment plant the size of Seabrook will be installed to clean up Boston Harbor. By the year 2000, the face of Boston will be a different one. The question is, will Boston survive the big day? Over the next decade, Boston will change radically. Plans made now will shape the city well into the next century. Although nothing is permanent, the practical truth is that what we know now will affect the city our children and their children live in for most of their lives. The discussion tonight will touch on the four ancient elements of alchemy, earth, air, fire, and water. Earth, millions of cubic yards must be moved and dumped somewhere. Air, our rights to light and clean air, free of traffic fumes. Fire, a possible solution to incineration of sewage sludge and water, that which we drink and that in Boston's harbor, now the nation's worst. Good evening, my name is Charles Ogletree. Tonight in the studio, we've assembled the men and women primarily responsible for a massive project designed to change Boston forever. These men and women represent federal, state, and city interests. They represent private community groups, developers, and environmental concerns. Although they've met in boardrooms and they've met in community meetings, they've never been assembled as a group to discuss the most important projects in Boston's history. Tonight, we have the occasion to do that. We'll discuss the multi-billion projects that will affect Boston in the future. The Central Artery, the Third Harbor Tunnel, and the massive cleanup of Boston Harbor. And we'll do that tonight by not only talking about the grand concept of making Boston one of the most important cities to live in in this nation, but we'll talk about the nuances and the small details. What about removing the dirt? What about the thousands of rats that will infest the streets during this excavation? What about the process of changing our beaches that are now cesspools into areas where we'll be happy to send our children, that they could safely swim on a summer day. We begin this evening's presentation with a taped discussion of the history of the Century Artery Project, narrated by Christopher Lydon of the 10 o'clock news. Northbound, the artery plugs up solid, but southbound, you hit the hang up as you're going down through and past the Haymarket into the South Station Tunnel, but the Callahan Tunnel. Boston's Central Artery, the main vessel of the city's lifeblood. Heavy traffic today, but come back and say 10 years and you won't see this road. It won't exist. In its place will be buildings, trees, grass, park benches even along a walkable urban boulevard. Underneath the completely rewoven city fabric will be a thundering tunnel carrying 185,000 cars and trucks every day. Before the 1990s are over, City, state, and federal governments will have spent roughly $4 billion for the single biggest road building project Boston has ever seen. The central artery will have been torn down and replaced with a double deck tunnel. The Massachusetts Turnpike will meet the Southeast Expressway and the central artery at a brand new interchange. A new six lane seaport access road will be built into South Boston. That road will link up with a new Third Harbor Tunnel to Logan Airport. And finally, an access road will be constructed from the expressway to industrial South Boston for trucks and buses only. While all that is going on, another three to six billion dollars will be spent cleaning up Boston Harbor. The Massachusetts Water Resources Authority will have traded in this Deer Island waste treatment plant for another one that's as big as the Seabrook nuclear generator. All this on top of the continuing boom in private construction, including, for example, Fan Pier on Fort Point Channel. Developers have talked of building the equivalent of five prudential centers right in this part of town. To complete the harbor cleanup and the central artery project, 8,000 construction workers will be reporting to work every day. They'll dig enough dirt to fill seven Sullivan stadiums. They'll use enough steel to construct 54 Tobin bridges. They'll pour enough concrete to build a four-foot-wide sidewalk most of the way around the world. 
The economic boom that's driving Boston is also driving these projects. The square feet of office space in the city has doubled in just the last 10 years. It will double again in the next 10. It wasn't always this way. From the Depression into the 1960s, Boston was stagnant. By the 1950s, city leaders were desperate to turn things around. In post-war America, the automobile was king, so a massive road project seemed like a logical way to bring commerce into town. Conceived originally in the 1930s, the central artery, they thought, would connect the city to the new interstate highway system and bring new life into Boston. But before the highway even opened, people realized the design was a mistake. It cut a huge swath out of the city's fabric. It sliced the waterfront off the downtown. Too many on and off ramps interrupted the flow of traffic. The road was designed to carry 65,000 cars a day. It's now clogged by roughly three times that volume. The plan to fix the central artery has been on the drawing boards for a decade. Only last spring did the project become eligible for 90% federal funding. Early next year, work will begin on the most challenging phase of the project, depressing the central artery. First, thousands of water and sewer lines, telephone cables, steam pipes, and other utilities will have to be cut and rerouted. Millions of rats living underground will have to be contained. Then, workers will construct underground concrete walls to support the elevated roadway, and the tunnel will be excavated. Motorists will continue to use the central artery until the tunnel is completed. Then, by, say, 1998, the elevated road will be torn down. By that time, the tunnel to Logan Airport will be finished. It will be constructed of pipe sections, assembled on land, floated into place, sunk, and then connected to other sections. During the next decade of construction, rising traffic, rising noise, rising air pollution are all unavoidable. East Boston and people on the North Shore and that the Logan Airport Tunnel was going to service Logan Airport, period. That's right. Every neighborhood touched by this project has its own specific concerns. East Boston has to worry that workers and material will spill over onto their streets and that the tunnel will encourage expansion of Logan Airport. The North End has to worry about the economic effect of 10 years of construction, also that the character of the neighborhood is going to change. And I've lived there all my life, and uh, it's a nice place to live, but I think it is going to block up the North End and all the beauty of it. And the business people. And the business and everything. South Boston has to be concerned about truck traffic and about massive new development that could come with the new roadway. We're standing on the threshold of projects that will change this city forever. The question has to be asked, will Boston survive the big dig? Mr. Salvucci, decades ago, people thought it was a great idea to construct the central artery. It's turned out to be a massive failure. What makes you think that the depression of the central artery will work this time? Well, the, I, I think you, you could imagine Boston without the central artery, how would you handle all of that traffic? What we're proposing with the depressed central artery is a facility that will handle about twice the capacity at the key bottlenecks underground uh, and that we'll be able to construct while existing traffic continues to function on the central artery. Uh, we've got a, a major transportation problem in the city. Uh, we've got to maintain traffic while we build the new facility. We know that the existing central artery uh, is structurally defective and eventually something's going to have to be done. This is the one opportunity we have to fix that while we maintain traffic, put the new facility underground. When it's done, the traffic will move better than it does today in significantly larger volumes to serve a growing economy, and the city can be knit back together. But it's part one shot to put this back together, and uh, I think, I, I, I know we can do this. But this project's going to cost mi billions of dollars, won't it? It's going to cost billions of dollars, uh, but it is the only way to deal with our transportation problem. Where are you uh, going to get the money? The question is, do we want to, I'm sorry. Where are you going to get the money? Well, we're very fortunate. Let me say first, this transportation problem is so serious that we need to do this however we pay for it. We're very fortunate that we've got an excellent congressional delegation that worked very hard to win eligibility for 90 percent federal funds last April. So we are positioned to get the vast majority of the funds from the federal government, but there is no alternate strategy that can meet the needs of a growing economy 
while we maintain traffic uh, during the construction process. Uh, people have been looking at this for 25 years. We've got a plan that will work for the traffic and work for the city. We're lucky we've got the federal funding eligibility that we won last year so we can carry it out at less expense to the state. Well, Senator McLean, is the state prepared to provide enough support to make sure this project is successful? Well, I, I'm interested in the fact that Freddie is commenting about the federal Congress and what they're going to do. I, I've always been led to believe that there's a section of the centrality that has not received funding yet. And my question uh, back to Freddie would be, uh, where is your insurance? You have to wait to 91, 92, and we don't know who's going to be in the White House. We don't know what's going to make up the Congress at that time. And I think that a lot of the things that are being planned are not being kept on schedule. I mean, a lot depends on the gentleman to my left here as far as environmental questions. And I, think, I don't think those have been addressed. And when they are addressed, I think the costs will go much higher. Mr. Savucci, are you prepared for these extra costs that the senator is concerned about? I think there are two issues. Number one, we are eligible for 90 percent federal funding on the entire project, including the center portion that the senator is referring to. We're eligible for 90 uh, percent federal funds. Every major project that this region has undertaken has been undertaken with the understanding that our economy demands it and with a belief that there will continue to be programs to support these into the future. If you look at the major transportation facilities in this area, Route 128, the central artery, the tunnels, mass turnpike were all built with Massachusetts resources. 495, relocation of the Orange Line, the Red Line extension, those projects are very large. They span more than one congressional act, and they've been successfully completed because this region knows how to put it together. My question back is, tell me another plan that can serve the transportation needs of the region. There isn't another one. This is the only way we've got. We've got to work together to make it happen. Senator McClain? Well, I don't think you're entirely right there, Fred. I think one of the things that I'm concerned about is member of the legislature who does not represent the area of Boston. I'm concerned about what's going to happen to the rest of the state while you're building the central artery. You haven't addressed the question yet about the uh, tunnel. This 10 percent money got to come from somewhere. Is it coming from Dave Davis or is it going to come from the Turnpike Authority? Uh, and you're the man who's going to direct that because although you have other people sitting as heads, you're really the kingpin and you're going to determine where that money is going to come from. I'm glad this so much confidence awaiting my recommendation, and I expect your support for the program. I, 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 I didn't say that. <laughs> now, that's the first laugh and probably the only one we're going to get. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Saul, you represent more of a regional interest. Are you concerned about the cost for this project? I think the costs are being uh, pretty well uh, taken care of by the federal and state sharing. I'm more concerned about the traffic impacts. We're already experiencing 25-minute delays crossing Route 1 in Peabody, and we're experiencing 15 to... 39% growth in traffic in Burlington, and what is the impact of something going on in central city Boston going to mean to traffic being pushed out into the suburban areas? What about that, Mr. Savucci? Are we going to move the, the, the central artery out to Route 128 and create the same problem there? No, I think not. I think that Boston is very well situated uh, to, from a transportation point of view because of the major investments in the MBTA uh, and the extensive commuter rail network that we've got. Uh, Boston's very well situated with alternative means of travel until such time as we've got the added capacity. But remember, the traffic problems that are being pointed to aren't being caused by the construction of transportation facilities. The construction of the transportation facilities is to accommodate that growth. We had 3 million cars on the road in Massachusetts about a decade ago. We're approaching 5 million cars now. That's a reflection of a good economy. That's nice. But there has been no expansion <coughs> in the highway capacity to deal with it. The answer to that is first expand the reliance on public transportation for the downtown. And with Jim O'Leary's good work at the T and the investment and the support of the legislature in, the, in those investments, we're very well situated for that. There will be problems out on Route 128 because there are no alternatives out there. That road, if the vacancy rate out on 128 fills, there's about 20 percent vacancy rate. When those office buildings fill, Route 128 is going to come close to gridlock and there is no T to take and you can't walk to work. Downtown Boston is better situated, I would submit, than any place else in the state to deal with the traffic uh, pressures of the next decade. Well, Mr. Hestens, as someone concerned about the business community, are you satisfied that this project's going to work? The depression of the central artery? Yes. I agree with uh, 
spread that something has to be done. I think the thing I still have a question about is what? Is it a full depression? Is it a project that takes uh, <coughs> eight years or more? And where is the funding coming from uh, for the full depression? For instance, $800 million was committed by the state, Fred, and I assume that comes from other unallocated federal highway funds. Am I correct? The $800 million we're expecting will be interstate reconstruction funds. Interstate reconstruction funds are 90 percent federally right. funded. It is the program which every state in the union relies on, and it's expected to expand significantly in the 1991 yeah. Is it fair to say that you'll be able to find $800 million of those funds without sacrificing other necessary projects in the balance of the state to answer Senator McClain's concern? Yes, because interstate reconstruction funds can only be used on interstate highways. The only major interstate work in the Commonwealth is on, on uh, the Central Lottery and the Third Harbor Crossing and Route 128, which is Interstate 95 and Interstate But Fred, now you've got an the overlay. The of the state is in very good shape in terms of interstate. All of the outstanding agenda, the bridges that the senator is not bashful about calling to remind us uh, of in other parts of the state, cannot use the interstate funds. So these funds are not competitive with the rest of the state. Fair enough. Now, that's the $800 million, which was part of the compromise struck with Congress to get the authorization, which uh, passed uh, uh, largely due to your very effective uh, work with the Congress. Uh, but now we have another problem, as I understand it, and that is an estimate that another billion dollars will be needed to complete the full depression in the Third Harbor Tunnel. Where is that additional billion dollars coming from? That that is also eligible for 90 percent funds. The Federal Interstate Highway Program, and this is not unique to Boston, the Federal Interstate Highway Program provides for an update for inflation every two years. Every highway in the country has been funded on this basis. It's been very reliable. Uh, and it was a recognition of the Congress that on a large project, you don't know at the beginning of the project what the impact of inflation will be. Each two years, you do a new estimate. We're in the process of preparing that new estimate now. But it is eligible for 90 percent reimbursement. Given the fight we had in getting the 2.2 uh, for both projects, mm -hmm. is it realistic to assume that Congress will increase the authorization to include another billion dollars in current estimated increased costs for these two projects? Uh, yes, it is realistic, among other things, because it doesn't require congressional authorization. It was programmed into this bill. Our congressional delegation did a, a terrific job for us last year. Speaker O'Neill's sure. leadership and, and Congressman Moakley and literally the whole delegation. Our two senators, as you know, uh, turned over that, uh, that presidential veto. Uh, and, uh, and literally, it was Massachusetts that, that did the trick on getting the, uh, the president's veto overridden. That bill provides that the dollars are available until ob obligated and that the cost adjustment, which occurs every two years, does not require another congressional but approval. But Fred, this that isn't a cost in. adjustment. Now, wait a minute. This is not a cost adjustment. This is an increased cost no. on the base, as estimated now. This is it? an inflation adjustment, and it was provided for in the bill. Well, even if we get the 90 percent from the federal government, are you concerned about getting the other 10 percent from the state? Of course I'm concerned. Senator always... McClain, can you uh, resolve Mr. Salvucci's concerns tonight? Well, I'm certainly, uh, Fred's been dealing with this a lot longer than I have, but Fred, uh, one of the concerns of the legislature certainly is that uh, when you build the Third Harbor Tunnel, where are you going to get the 10 percent? Are you going to take it from Dave Davis or have Florida bond issues through Dave Davis through the Port Authority? Are you going to take it from the Turnpike Authority? Are you going to come to the legislature for the 10 percent? Where are you going to get the funds? Uh, we committed at your, uh, at your insistence uh, in the law that, that we would come like back. That sounds like a safe term. <laughs> uh, we can, we, that, that we prepare uh, a financial report indicating all of the alternatives how to come up with the 10 percent. Interstate 495, done on your end of the state, was financed, the 10 percent was financed with state funds. There is the possibility here that either the Port Authority or the Turnpike Authority could play a role in that it's expected the new tunnel will be a toll facility. Even that not decision has not firmly been made. When will that decision be made? Sir? We expect to come back to the legislature next fall with a recommendation with the results of this financial study, and there'll be alternatives there to do it. But I, but Fred, I think to put you, things in context... When you talk about Senator, that, excuse me, when you Senator, talk the, about funding of that, and I just want to add, you're going to be building the Cana project on the north side, and you're going to be doing the tunnel on the south side, and you're going to have the business community in between with these two massive projects going. And I, if I recall back a couple of years ago, 
you had an occasion when the Department of Public Works tried a project of, uh, of a new turnoff and you blocked up everything coming in from the north, and now you've got the Cana project and you've got the tunnel going to be built, and nobody's going to be able to get into Boston, I would think that the business community is going to fight desperately to stop any funding. Well, I, I think there, there are three answers to that. Number one, I'd point to the Southeast Expressway <coughs> reconstruction, uh, which went on, I think, better than people expected. Bob Tinney, the commissioner, did a very good job. Yeah, but that, that was, was one much... project to the south. There wasn't one in the north and one in the uh, south. Senator, you got one from each end. Let me point out that in many ways, from a traffic management point of view, it was a tougher job. Because in the Southeast Expressway, you had an eight-lane expressway. You had to take two lanes and physically <laughs> give it to the contractor and constrain the public to the remaining six lanes. On the project we're talking about, we're going to maintain traffic on the existing central artery, as good as a batter as it is now. We're going to underpin that. That traffic's going to continue. We're not directly affecting the regional facility as we did in the case of the Southeast Expressway. The tunnel construction is offline. It's off to the side. Yes, it'll be visible, but it is not as tough a job for traffic maintenance as the Southeast Expressway. And I think it's real important that responsible people help to explain that process because in the Southeast Expressway, the expectations of disaster almost helped us in the sense that people kept saying, isn't this going to be terrible? We said no, but the press played it up that, gee, this is going to be terrible. And then when it wasn't terrible, everybody said, gee, what a great job. The predictions of doom and gloom are themselves destructive. Uh, there, are, there are people who are trying to market office space on 128, saying go out to 128 uh, because there's going to be a traffic jam in Boston. The uh, Consumer Protection Division of the Attorney General's Office should get after them because the traffic problems on 128 are potentially worse than the ones downtown because there are no options there. If we work together, this is a doable job. It is less complex than what we did with the Southeast or what Jim O'Leary's people did in Harvard Square with the Red Line. It's a tough urban job, but it is doable. But it requires cooperation with the city, cooperation with the business community, and the support of the legislature for the funding. Thank you very much for today's conference committee. Three billion dollars to further the transportation needs of the Commonwealth. We'll very appreciate them. We'll be back in two years for more. So we're off to a good start now. Mr. Very Larry, good start. What about because you? of the Senate's leadership. You're, let me ask, ask, let me ask, ask Mr. Mr. Larry if I can't we'll get oh, back okay. to it. You're responsible for the mass transit system here That's in correct. the state. That's right. What are you going to do to respond to this new development of the central artery? Well, the fact is, Charles, we've been responding for the last uh, 15 years. I mean, one of the things that makes the highway reconstruction uh, possible over the next decade is that for the last 15 years, major investments have been made at the MBTA. Some $2 billion, you're talking about billions of dollars in the next decade, $2 billion have already been invested in the MBTA. We expect over the next couple of years we will add 150,000 seats on the transit system. From today, 600,000 to another 150,000, 750,000 additional trips. So we're already there. We're already putting in place the major elements. The new orange line, which opened last spring. The red line, which opened two years ago. The commuter rail improvements. Uh, thanks again for the legislative effort uh, and the bond issue that was approved today. Additional commuter rail cars. We have on order 107 commuter rail cars that we're taking delivery of now, an additional 45 later this year. And in the bond issue, for the first time in, in Boston's history, we're talking about double-decker commuter rail cars to provide that level of service. So there's tremendous capacity being built into the system. We have a tremendous amount of experience, which the department and the secretariat will be able to build on in building these kind of major projects. The Harvard Square project probably is as difficult as any elements of this project downtown. That was a project also that a lot of people expected real problems with. People have said to me the traffic in the Harvard Square was better during the construction than it was before or after. So to some extent that kind of attention to detail during the construction can be helpful overall. Well, it sounds like this is going fine. <clears throat> Mr. Brightnaker, as, uh, as an interest in development, is the development community interested in uh, this project? Is, is it as likely to be successful as we've heard tonight? It certainly has the potential to be that successful. Uh, it's a grand vision and uh, I yield to the gentleman on my right about congratulating the secretary on getting it through this far. And the key <coughs> issue is what uh, Fred said, which is the cooperation that's necessary. And if you go back to the uh, Southeast Expressway, one of the key elements of that was the attention to detail, the planning, preparation, uh, the fact that every minute of every day was watched. And another very important thing began to happen there, which is that uh, the state thought about mitigation measures. Uh, the money for the Southeast Expressway also produced money to create commuter water transportation from the South Shore, which began as a baby 
And now we'll uh, probably have almost a million people in, one, in this year riding uh, boats from Hingham to Boston to Rose Wharf. So there are real opportunities if the cooperation is truly there. Okay, Mr. DeLand, has Mr. Salvucci done all that he needs to do to take care of the permits and the other small details necessary for this project? I think there are a few small details that need to be resolved. Uh -huh. uh, what are those small as, details? Well, the one small one where we're going to put uh, some 7 million cubic yards of excavated and dredged material. Good question. I haven't figured out a spot for that yet. And some other details of that magnitude. I think what we have before us here is an enormous uh, opportunity. And it's an opportunity that comes along just once in our lifetime, once in a generation. If you look at this project along with the other major projects, the Harbor Project we'll be discussing uh, later, later this evening, and ancillary projects such as prison relocations, we've got $10 billion worth of taxpayer money, you're in my taxpayer bucks, that are on the table. And the question for all of us tonight is, are we going to use that money uh, wisely and well, and will the end result, the decade of turmoil, be worth it? So you're optimistic, but you're still reserving judgment. Those little details need to be worked out before Those you Those little details need to be worked out. They do. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Rubikis, are you concerned about this type of project on the community of South Boston? Well, we have a number of concerns. The first and foremost is obviously the traffic uh, that could go through the residential neighborhood of South Boston. What's happening now? Uh, it's a difficult situation at best now with the automobiles going through I Street, L Street, residential areas in South Boston. What happened when they resurfaced the expressway um, quite some time ago, they routed a lot of traffic through residential South Boston, and uh, we have a number of problems with that. We want to be certain that the same thing doesn't happen again. We want to make sure that there's access for the communities and emergency vehicles, fire apparatus, or anything like that, to make sure that they can get through. If uh, the people are on the expressway and uh, for any reason there's a tie-up, they immediately go through South Boston. And that could happen even with the construction of this uh, Fred Salvucci is going to be blamed for everything for the next 10 or 12 years. <laughs> there's, no, there's no question about Sounds that. Sounds like he should run for office. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this is not elective position. But, but, <laughs> but, but let, me, let me point to the map and ask Map to point, to point out <coughs> that we've heard the concerns in South Boston about trucks. We've heard them for some time. And that's why the first element of construction uh, on this project will be the uh, truck route on the so-called South Boston Bypass. That line will be in what is now the Conrail Cut, which is very underutilized. So all truck traffic uh, coming not only to the construction site, but also to the seaport activity, those trucks that have been plaguing the South Boston community for the past 25 years, at the very beginning of this project, can go on to that truck route and actually see some relief on South Boston residential streets. Those plans have been approved? Th those plans are an official part of the state's proposal. This is a complicated approval process, but that is a very strong commitment of Governor Dukakis and the legislative leadership uh, and the mayor are all agreed on, uh, on that truck bypass as a key element in this project. The, the first elements you see go into construction will be those so-called mitigation measures to deal with trucks in South Boston and to deal with replacement parking uh, for the merchant area in the north end. So the the commitments to mitigation are real, and the community is going to see them at the front end, not in the great by and by. They have to go in first. A lot of these problems, if we hear them early, can identify them, are really opportunities. The question of what to do with the fill, you can see that as a problem. You can also see that as an opportunity. The vast majority of that material, as far as we can tell from our testing, is clean material. We have a hazardous situation out on Spectacle Island. That material can be a solution to that hazardous material problem by capping it. We've got hazardous materials 20 miles offshore in the Fowl area and in the, uh, and in the industrial waste area. This clean fill, uh, which is the bulk of the fill, can help to cap some of those problems that are left over from past years. So if we work together, some of the problems become opportunities. The commuter boot that was pointed out to deal with a problem in the southeast is now one of the most popular services to the south shore. And Mr. Breitnecker and Mr. O'Leary can argue about whether it's an MBTA service because it's a T-run service or whether it's Rose Wharf because they've got the, the WAF, but it's, it's a great example of a problem turned into an opportunity. Okay. Well, Ms. Pugliano, in terms of problems, you must be concerned about the North End. 
it's obvious that this, the, the central order is already separated, physically separated at the north end from much of the greater Boston. Are you concerned about this project also having an impact on the residents of the North End? Yes, and uh, we can't take the narrow parochial point of view because what happens in the North End waterfront area, and I specify the waterfront is going to be impacted just as much as the core North End, will happen in every other neighborhood. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, Mr. Selvucci. He's been very cooperative. But somehow we feel it isn't moving fast enough for us, or in a binding way. And there's always the specter that this is a long project. We'll have a different governor. We'll have a different secretary of transportation. I'd like to think that Mr. Selvucci and I will walk down the completed artery together, hand in hand. But perhaps it won't happen. Uh, we need binding commitments. I don't know what the legal documents are, and I think Fred knows this. We've thrashed it out at task force meetings. Uh, we need an ob ombudsman of our own. We need a planner. We're all working people. We're not technically savvy. Yes, we can tap in with all these very fine people, but we don't know what questions to ask. Mm -hmm. Mr. King, uh, do you think this is a, a part of the Massachusetts miracle? Um, I think we need to pick up on the last uh, comments in terms of uh, binding. Um, and what leads me to that is uh, the fact that we're talking now about this macro activity. And um, there's a danger that we forget about the little micro things that are going on. Uh, we have the orange line. And there was supposed to be a replacement service for it. Um, to this date, uh, there isn't a replacement service for it. And it has left the community in a somewhat competitive uh, kind of position uh, where uh, small stores, merchants, and things may uh, be once again hurt. Uh, and so uh, when you talk about the whole transportation piece uh, and say you have it set, and she talks about wanting something uh, in concrete, if you will, uh, I say that you really ought to try and nail it down and if you don't believe it, ask the people along the Washington Street corridor who have been left in a lurch um, by the same kind of activities under this administration. Well, I, I, would, I would strongly disagree with that observation. I think that uh, we have produced over the last decade uh, one of the finest transit systems in the country in the Orange Line. And there have been significant improvements, significant involvement of minority contractors, minority people working on that project. Mm -hmm. But in the Washington Street corridor, there continues to be uh, confusion in within the neighborhoods themselves as to which of the alternatives ought to be implemented. We have instead gone ahead and implemented one of the bus alternatives. We're running bus service at the highest level we can provide in that corridor today and have been doing so since the Orange Line closed. Mm -hmm. So I think that even though the federal people, the federal Department of Transportation have delayed the implementation of a final replacement mm -hmm. service, we have put in the highest quality bus service that we can provide in that corridor. Yeah, but the, the, but the point the here is line that closed. Um, <coughs> something was supposed to be done for the people so that when one was completed, they'd be able to uh, move into the other. And that was and done. That, that, that was done no, it with wasn't the bus done. It wasn't done. done. It, was it done wasn't done. Service. That's why there's confusion in the community. <coughs> and I see the same kind of uh, potential here with uh, the promises at the macro level and uh, forgetting about really making secure the people uh, at the street level. I think inevitably on in a project, if it takes this long, and I think the lady from the North End makes a good point. It is a project that will take uh, some time to get built. And I think inevitably one of the things that will happen is the constituencies and the people around the table will change. And I think one of the things we saw in the corridor was that people who might have expressed 10 or 12 years ago a decision as to which of the options, for example, replacement service might be preferable, some of that constituency has changed. And as people, and as neighborhoods mature and change, there's different perspective. I think the important thing is that See, we have that begs process. The question. I think we have in process. But that begs the question. <laughs> At the point that there was a decision that could have been made where funds should have been allocated and the people should have been moving along uh, in a parallel situation, it never happened. And, uh, and you took advantage of uh, <coughs> levels of disorganization in the community instead of trying to work with them so that they wouldn't be in this particular situation the, right the now. The major obstacle to having a final decision on replacement service was the election of Ronald Reagan in 1982. That's the that was the obstacle. The federal government closed down for us the possibility of building rail transit in that corridor when they said that. They basically said deferred, they continue to defer 
as you know, we've, we've developed the environmental impact statement. They tell us you cannot circulate that document because the federal government will not participate in that process. Again, I think it's an issue that we're all committed to try to work with. I think that uh, uh, respectfully, uh, what Mel's point is, is that, that there's some uh, consistency in, in the process. I think we're still open on that process. I think we're trying to provide the best possible service in the alternative, and we've been doing that. Mr. Rain, what about the governor's <coughs> position on this? Is the government committed to making this a project that's of interest to all the people of the state? He certainly is, Charles. Uh, the economy of the metropolitan community, of the city by all means, of the central city by all means, but of the entire metropolitan community of all Massachusetts and of all New England very clearly depends on the ability of the center of the region, namely downtown Boston, the airport, the seaport, uh, to grow and expand and move and process all of this economic activity. Uh, I agree with the basic premise on which Fred and the governor and the mayor have proceeded for a long time that we don't have an alternative to building this project. One of the things that we're very committed to do while it's going on so that people can reap the benefits of it now as it's getting built and not just later when it's done is to make sure that the greatest opportunity possible for people in the city, young people, minorities, women, everybody who will be needed uh, to, to work on the transportation uh, construction uh, will have that opportunity. And we've been working very closely with the city, with the business community, with the building trades, uh, and many others uh, in the metropolitan area to see to it that we have a way to get from here to there uh, on this labor question. Uh, Does that mean the governor's committing jobs to residents of the state, this project? By all means, the when you look at the approximately $10 billion worth uh, of construction under the control of the Commonwealth or the city of Boston, uh, just inside 495, uh, it's, uh, it's the same $10 billion, I assume, that Mike DeLand referred to before. Uh, that's going to take 14 to 15,000 people uh, at the peak of construction when many of these jobs are being built at the same time in the early 90s to fill. Our commitment is to make sure that to the greatest degree possible, the people doing those jobs are local people. And the construction over this decade... Wait a minute now. Wait, wait a minute. How can you do that? I mean, the people from New Bedford, where I represent, they pay taxes as much as anybody else. Why are you going to give them to Boston? That isn't fair. That's what you just said. No, That's because the mayor said it. Now, are you no. speaking for the mayor or what? No, no, no. No, but I'm speaking for the mayor. <laughs> All right, speak for him. Mr. Tomino. And we are absolutely interested in making sure that the job opportunities of the Ottery Tunnel Project, because of well, then why points. don't you come up with the 10% that's got to be paid? The bottom line is, is that this, this project is impacting 19 different neighborhood areas in our city. It's happening in our backyard. The quality of life in our neighborhoods, first of all, as it relates to this project, have to be protected. The issues of our economy and the points that Harold Hessness raised have to be preserved. Over the last 10 years, 50,000 jobs, Senator, have been created. Those are jobs that have been distributed within Boston and the region. Another 50,000 jobs are expected to be created over the next 10 years. Those jobs, again, are Boston jobs and regional jobs. We think that Boston absolutely deserves, at least in, as it relates to the Boston's job ordinance, its fair share. What's the fair the share? Jobs. Give us a percentage. What are you talking well, we, about? We expect <laughs> our jobs ordinance asks for 50% of the jobs that are being created as, well as, as relates to this project. And what about Boston. minority concern? And we, we ask that at, uh, at least over 30% of the jobs are created to min minorities and women within, within the Boston job ordinance. Mr. Ray, does the governor, hey, su need, governor support that? We need that? more than an ask. We want a commitment, because that's what that's is, right. uh, is significant. And then we need to know what specific steps are going to be taken to guarantee that the percentage of jobs is going to accrue to the people uh, in the city. And I'd like to hear the one, two, three steps that you're going to take. What, one other point that I'd like to add to Mel's, Mel's, we absolutely need commitments. And one of the other things that we absolutely need is a training program that's designed to get Boston residents to be prepared to work on this project. And I know that the Secretary is committed to that training program, but I would agree with Mal that we also need commitments to meeting uh, the requirements of Boston job bonds as Mr. well. Mr. Ray, can you answer that, or Mr. Let's, let, let's be clear on this. Uh, the training is absolutely the centerpiece of creating, making accessible these opportunity, particularly to kids in Boston, because they're the closest, and it makes sense, and it's fair. But Ninety percent of the money is coming from the federal government. The other ten percent is coming from the state government. 
Senator McLean is absolutely right. Somebody from New Bedford wants to work on that job, he's got a right to. His taxes help pay for it. And it's a silly argument because the problem is not going to be sharing the jobs. The problem is going to be finding the labor to build a job. We've got a tremendous opportunity here to train young people for whom these jobs can make all the difference. And we ought to not be talking about percentages and bureaucratic mechanisms that will be here for 50 years. We ought to be talking about how do we put together the training resources so that this problem, so-called, becomes the opportunity that it really is for Boston kids and Chelsea kids and Somerville kids and New Bedford kids. And you're committed to that process. Absolutely. Well, We're committed. Mrs. Riley, we, we, are there what, people in your community who, you know, are, who need probably, jobs now? Excuse me just a minute. Mrs. Riley, I assume there are people in East Boston who are anxious to call <clears> Mr. <throat> Salbuti or whoever they need to call to get a job, aren't they? Yeah, there are a lot of kids. Um, we have the second highest unemployment rate in the city of Boston. What percentage for a long are you talking about? Uh, well, more than half our kids drop out of school, uh, about 48 percent, and most of those kids are unemployed. Um, but I'd like to to bring something up here uh, when you talk about kids, because I work with kids. But I was a kid uh, too, and 29 years ago I was 16, and I'm not ashamed to say that. And they took our house for the second tunnel, during which time men similar to the men that are here, um, the so-called experts stated then that the second tunnel would probably be the last tunnel to be built and that that tunnel would become a freeway in the early 1990s. Um, that second tunnel became obsolete and it's not even 30 years later. And I disbelieve the fact that the third tunnel is, in fact, needed as proposed. I don't understand why the alternatives really haven't been researched, such as rapid transit tunnel. Why are we encouraging people from out of the Boston area to drive to Logan Airport? Why are we not encouraging rapid transit, buses, trains, and things like that? You can move people quicker, safer, faster, with less noise and air pollution. I don't understand the thinking that goes on here. Well, maybe Mr. Davis can answer that question. Well, You're responsible for Massport. Uh, does Mrs. Riley have a good point there? Well, I think she has a very good point. And in fact, we are encouraging folks uh, right now to use mass transit. And I think we'll have to continue to encourage people to use mass transit and other modes, even after the completion of the project, uh, to, to make uh, for a more civilized East Boston, as well as an airport that can handle the millions more people that will be uh, wanting to use the airport. And I think we've been successful uh, in doing this uh, over the past uh, three years that we've had a, a specific campaign for this. Uh, three years ago, 56% of the people that went to Logan used their private cars. Uh, today, the number is 46%. That's an incredible change in the number of traffic. Now, there are more people going to Logan so it may not seem uh, different in that, uh, in that set of circumstances. But I defy you to find another airport uh, in the country uh, where this kind of a, a change uh, in uh, habit uh, has occurred, where people uh, are, are really breaking their favorite habit, which is their automobile. But can't we be I, I, uh, pioneers in that area? Can't Boston well, I think we, we can be pioneers, and we are. Joe Breitnecker has a great announcement tonight. Uh, Mr. Breitnecker and I have a joint uh, project uh, called the Water Shuttle uh, to uh, Logan Airport. So that's some interesting news. I mean, uh, would you Mr. like to Mr. Breitnecker, say? what's the great news? <laughs> <laughs> here and here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some things I don't know about. <laughs> Come on. 100,000 riders as of today. In the first nine months of the shuttle is a year-round collaborative effort between Massport and Beacon Management Corporation. Um, and it proves the argument about alternatives and thinking it through in terms of the overall planning of the region. Uh, the fact that those 100,000 people probably resent, uh, represent uh, you know, 90,000 cars that might have been going through the tunnels is the first step toward the kind of, of, of long-range thinking that goes beyond uh, just the central artery as an up or down operation, but an overall planning context. But I think, I think the point as it relates to alternatives is a fine one. And as Joe and, and Dave and I have been working on making the water transportation system work, the point that Fran raises is that the tunnel is going to improve access to Logan Airport. Unfortunately, for the abutting communities, particularly East Boston, the growth anticipation of Logan as a result of that improved access is what's got the community most concerned. That means we need to find ways to maintain or control the growth at Logan 
so it's not spreading out into the community as a result of improved access to that airport. And that's what the bottom line is for the East Boston community. Yes, Mr. Riley? I'd like to bring something else up here, uh, Mr. Davis. I know you're the director. Why don't you remove cargo from Logan Airport completely? Put it in an existing base. You have several military bases that are lying there doing nothing. Take the cargo out. You remove trucks. You remove vans from our local streets. You remove pollution of both types. I mean, there are other alternatives, and I can't believe that sitting in this room, you have not examined those other things. I we took a helicopter ride, and I, you look down, and it's crazy. Well, we have examined the cargo, uh, uh, cargo issue. In fact, uh, if you fly on an airplane, you might wonder what's below you, and the answer is cargo. And the answer basically is about half of the cargo that's shipped through Logan goes with passengers. Uh, and uh, so it's very difficult to split off cargo to another airport, although I think that you could split off the small package type cargo uh, without uh, causing any problems. Mr. Hess, to ask your question, I assume that members of the business community are concerned about this excavation because there are sewer lines, telephone lines, electricity lines, gas and water lines that are going to be opened up and possibly cut off. Is that likely to have an impact on the business community? Well, right now, some of the utility relocations have to be done twice. You have uh, main transmission lines of Boston Edison from their South Boston facility that intersects this path. I don't know if the camera can see the model here, but uh, or maybe Matt Coogan uh, can show where uh, both Boston Gas and Boston Edison have major uh, feeder lines that go through here. And I, my understanding is that some may have to be relocated twice. We are concerned. We really don't understand the full logistical implications of how this is going to be executed. And in fairness to Fred Salvucci, I think there are many things that are unknown even now as to the staging areas. Uh, now, the, the ripple effects of these are uh, rather mind-boggling. Uh, are we going to take open space, which is now used for parking, for staging areas, for either the tunnel or the uh, central artery depression, or both? And we haven't even addressed the MWRA uh, harbor pollution uh, project yet. We need to know the answers to that to know how livable all of these projects, and Al Rain said $10 billion within 495. It isn't that. It's $10 billion within probably the smallest ge geographical configuration that we've ever seen in urban America. And how this is to be staged and the implications of staging we need to have some hard answers, too, which probably are not available at this time, but we certainly want to hear them early rather than later, Fred. Mr. Salvatore? Yeah, I, I think that's an absolutely valid point. We've got at least two years before serious construction starts so that people can have that information, know what's coming, and when people know what's coming, we can plan around it. But I would submit, to put things in context, just look at this model. Uh, this is not a building boom about to happen. This is a building boom that has been happening. We've been living with tremendous construction in this city. Each one of those spikes uh, represents a separate project that couldn't be coordinated with the other project because they were all individual private decisions. We've been enjoying a very good economy with a lot of construction. It has produced some disruption, but on balance I think it's been good. This project is not dissimilar in scale to what's been happening, but it has the advantage that it is one project. It can be coordinated, and by working together, we can turn some of these problems into opportunities. You know, people have talked about fill. It's mostly clean fill. Maybe the one chance we've got to cap some of the terrible stuff that our predecessors dumped out on Spectacle Island out in the offshore area. We've got to decide carefully how best to use that opportunity, because you're not going to find 7 million cubic yards of clean fill again in a hurry. There's been discussion about rats. We aren't breeding the rats. The rats are here. Every downtown building that excavates, those rats move, and they move into the downtown neighborhoods, and people are absolutely right to ask that question. We've got an opportunity to do a rodent control program in the downtown, do this job once, and do it right, so that problem doesn't continually recur. This process has basically moved the rodents from one block to another. And that's been very disruptive for the people who live near this activity. Can we move them out to the harbor, Fred, or won't that work either? <laughs> 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 Mr. Foy? 
Uh, it seems to me that it's important to step back a bit here, and I guess I, I want to come to Fred Salvucci's defense a little bit, because Fred's being asked to fix a very difficult problem. I, there's, I doubt anyone in this room disputes the fact that we have a terrible traffic problem in the city, uh, that the city is bordering on paralyzing itself, paralyzing its own business and industry uh, because of the automobile. Uh, we're bludgeoning the neighborhoods with uh, commuter parking, with traffic that is really impacting the quality of life in all the neighborhoods. It's one of the reasons the neighborhoods are so concerned about this project. The thing that concerns me is that I see a huge road project, an important one. Um, we can all debate about what is necessary and what's the most appropriate way to solve this traffic problem, but I think Fred makes a very important point, which is something has got to get done. We do have to build something. Uh, whether it's the depressed central artery or it's some other magical solution, the cars are not going to evaporate. Uh, and <coughs> what concerns me is that we've gotten ourselves into this fix in the first place. And all of us are sitting around this room debating the various meticulous details on how we're going to fix this problem. Um, it's very complicated. It's always complicated to retrofit back into an existing situation and all those buildings on that model a new road system or a new transportation system to handle all the cars that all those buildings generate. What worries me is, one, that's very difficult to do, and two, there's no guarantee that we're not going to repeat the same sin, the same error, 10 years out, 15 years out. Fred is going to build a road um, and build an improved transit system that will, much of the capacity in that transit system and many of the, much of the capacity of the road will be consumed <coughs> before it's even finished because of all the development in the boom in Boston that is literally going to overrun what we're now trying to catch up to. The concern really needs to be, how do we couple transportation planning with the growth planning <coughs> that the city is sorely missing right now? And how do we make sure that we will not find ourselves in the year 2000, having suffered through 10 or 12 years of agony to get this project done, only to find that we're no better off than we are today? Mr. Lee, is this plan obsolete before it's even begun? Well, I think that the uh, problem is that uh, planning is an anti-American <coughs> word. I mean, we've gotten ourselves into this mess because we assume that the uh, market-driven forces will somehow take care of us, and then people like Fred will come along and fix it. You know, it's a, and I, what's going to happen is that the, um, some basic attitudes of Americans have to change. That is, the right to drive your automobile downtown at any time you want, uh, for any reason, free, is going to vanish. I think what, you're right. I mean, if we build this today, 15, 20 years from now, we will have the same problem because the growth will continue. That is, we hope growth will continue. The, um, but if the growth in automobiles continue the way it has been going, then there will be 9 million automobiles in the state. 12 million because we still love to get in our automobiles and go somewhere. My guess is that, the, uh, that we're going to have to go through measures that other countries have begun to make, which is traffic management. Uh, you know, Singapore puts a, a special tax for cars to come downtown. Uh, other uh, places are talking about putting meters on downtown streets in which registers the number of chips you take and make the differential toll for different times. That is, if we're going to have extraordinary <coughs> congestion at 9 AM, it's going to cost you $4. And if you're going to come at midnight, maybe it costs you less. And so I think we're going to really look at the next stage is not more construction. I think the next stage is more management and changes in attitudes. And I think they're going to change because it's going to be different. Since McLean, you think you can sell that one? A tariff they, on those who use the roads during certain hours? Is that a good idea? You asking me that? Yes. <laughs> Can you sell that to your constituents? I'm a no tax guy. <laughs> no, I think Ray Flynn would like that idea better than I would. But, you know, talking about, I think the problem that I see from somebody who commutes into town, and I, I realize what Fred has to do and Jim has to do, it's a tremendous responsibility. And we gave him funds this year to to the uh, old Colony Railroad to bring in uh, commuter rail there and also up in the uh, Newburyport area. But I think the question is that the media, in a sense, 
has got everybody confused because every time we look at a time schedule, they say that we're going to be doing the tunnel in such and such a date or we're going to be uh, doing utilities in such and such a date. And then you turn around and you try to find out from the environmental people, you know, ha have they got the permits? Have they got the licenses? Where are they going to put the fill and like that? And these things haven't been uh, given yet. Also, you hear the city of Boston and always saying that, well, we might not let them do this job. Uh, they're the benefits of this whole thing. But the problem is, is that members of the legislature at this time don't have a good feel of what's happening here, in my opinion. I think most of us agree a third harbor tunnel is needed in the legislature. That is. I know some people here don't <laughs> agree. Uh, but we're also concerned because we see the Cana project in Charlestown starting, and we know that uh, with the tunnel being built, we see a tremendous blockage in really the core of the city. And I think that's what scares most of the members of the legislature, because no matter what happens, we will be blamed. When the, when the congestion gets on the Southeast Expressway, we're the ones who get the phone calls along with Fred. Okay, Mr. Delano, are they overlooking some important points in this project? Well, let me speak, if I may, for a minute, just in, in broad terms. I think that Tony Lee raised an excellent point when he said that we have to change lifestyles, age-old habits, that if current habits continue, that when Fred uh, cuts the ribbon for that uh, depressed artery with justifiable pride, because he's done a tremendous job, but it's going to be at status quo. And we will have spent $4 billion to move a traffic jam underground. Now, recognizing that, let's start planning now to avoid it so that the, the traffic uh, will flow For example. More, more easily. For example, uh, some of the kinds of things that Mr. Lee was, was talking about, uh, increased emphasis on uh, mass transit, on uh, ferry systems. Uh, Dave Davis has done a remarkable job, but more can be done. I think we ought to start talking about the new tunnel, not as the third tunnel, but the fourth tunnel. There's already a third tunnel under there, that MBTA tunnel that very few people know about and fewer still use. And 100,000 riders is, is great, but why isn't it 200, 300, 400? I mean, C Seattle moves enormous numbers of, of people very efficiently and, and quickly. So we've got to look at this whole situation in broad brush uh, terms. To get people out of their autom automobiles is going to be tough. And I think EPA tried it uh, in the early 1970s, and it was a disaster. I think rather than through enforcement mechanisms, we need to think of, in of incentives. Uh, for those that are carpooling, van pool. Well, let me say, I'm trying to figure out how, what's, how it's going to work. I'm concerned. Ms. Kaliana, I want to bring uh, my wife and children over to the North End, one of those fine restaurants. Now, how am I going to get there from uh, Central Square at 8 o'clock at night one Friday evening? Am I going to be able to make it there with this new uh, Central Artery? If you use the MBTA. Okay. <clears throat> but I think you also have to have the, these alternatives that are successful. I wish you would work at it a little harder. I wish you would make the MBTA cleaner and safer for people to use. It's a tough choice, isn't it? Um, it's your car as opposed to using the mass transit, right? Water transportation has been successful. It's a drop in the bucket. But people are paying a little more for that than they would ordinarily. Can we it's make a little it less more expensive. Can we make it less expensive, How about Mr. more Davis? airports? Mr. Davis, can we make water transportation less expensive as an alternative means of travel? I think it gets less expensive as you get uh, more people uh, aboard. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, Joe will tell you that the, uh, that the connection to the airport uh, is way ahead of our pro forma. Uh, and uh, that's good uh, uh, because uh, it means that uh, that Beacon uh, is doing a little better than they thought they would and are continually, for that reason, <coughs> upgrading their equipment. And we saw the boats winterize this year, and we saw all kinds of uh, creature comforts uh, added uh, to the boat. So I also think that there are other things that we have to do. Uh, at the airport, we have uh, begun to develop remote parking lots uh, with uh, frequent bus service uh, uh, to the airport uh, to get people uh, uh, off the, uh, the road system. This project will have uh, high-occupancy vehicle lanes, I think, at least uh, on the south Boston side. 
it'll be high occupancy vehicles. Uh, to get those buses into the tunnel quickly, to make it easier uh, to use uh, high occupancy vehicles, buses, limousines to get to the airport. We are seriously looking at reconfiguration of the airport in such a way that it will accept uh, high occupancy vehicles uh, better and make it more comfortable, more attractive, better to use that kind of uh, 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 vehicle. I'm all in favor of positive reinforcement. Uh, we all know that there's a lot of negative reinforcement out on the streets every day. I think if we can give people uh, a good, clean, safe ride, uh, they will use uh, 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 the key or whatever, and I think Jim O'Leary is approving that uh, every day. Mr. Ray? Yeah, I'm troubled by the sense that uh, with the emphasis on, on this massive project uh, and the dominant role it's going to play, that there's an automatic assumption that all of the alternatives that are being discussed here uh, aren't being pursued to the fullest. Uh, we work for a governor whose belief in transit uh, is legendary uh, and who ironically many people think doesn't like cars. That's not the case. But if you look at what's been going on, uh, there's been a lot of talk about water transportation. Uh, we want to be like Seattle. If you look at this harbor and if you look at how close in the East Boston, Charlestown, North End, Downtown, and South Boston waterfronts are to each other, water transportation is the thing of the future in this harbor in this central city. The efforts that are being made now by the T, by Massport, by Joe Breitnecker and his colleagues are only the beginning, and I think everyone sees they're only the beginning. Every time somebody wants to build a development along this waterfront, the city and the Commonwealth make them do what Joe Breitnecker and his colleagues have done namely to put in the facilities and participate in the economics of water transportation. And we think the future for that is tremendous. The MBTA has added massive capacity in the course of these last 10 years and is adding massive capacity right now, uh, both in the transit system, uh, the traditional transit system, and the commuter rail system. Uh, it's, a, it's an order of magnitude kind of increase in capacity <coughs> and service and efficiency. Uh, lost in all of this, although it's been mentioned uh, by Senator McLean, is the fact that the old colony railroad reconstruction is the reopening of an entire system in the least well-served corridor, the South Shore. The worst transportation mistake anyone ever made was the collective mistake that all of our predecessors made when the Southeast Expressway opened and the old colony system was allowed to die within months of each other. That was crazy. It was crazy then. It's twice as, you know, many times as crazy now, and we're fixing it. Uh, the legislature has given us a tremendous boost uh, with the authorization for the state share of the old colony. We're pursuing the federal half of this very vigorously. That's a commitment to take tens of thousands of people out of their automobiles on the South Shore, the fastest growing region with the poorest overall transportation, and get them into something other than an automobile. And lastly, also nearly lost, and this Dave mentioned it a moment ago, it was the governor's insistence and his idea, in fact, the Third Harbor Tunnel and the Seaport Access Road is, among other things, a transit tunnel. You will be able to go to South Station and check into your airline at South Station and take a bus to the airport. You'll be able to take an express bus from other places in the metropolitan area. And get take into care that of your tunnel. luggage and tickets. I mean, yeah. everything you, you can and, do right at South Station. And, and get right to Logan Airport. The, the sense of vision of how Mr. to move to your all frowning. these people. Are you, are you satisfied that that's going to happen? You're frowning. No, that is absolutely part of the plan. I was just frowning because I remembered that Dave Davis has just started that kind of service out of Framingham so that the same kind of opportunity that we're talking about in downtown Boston, Massport's already started the process out at Framingham. Uh, we've been working directly with the people who are interested in, in Framingham Shoppers World to incorporate that into a building with more parking spaces where you get the kind of full service you're talking about. Be able to buy your ticket, get your car washed while you leave it there and serviced, take the bus straight to Logan Airport, it's one of the fastest growing services that uh, the Port Authority is providing right now. That is now. And Al is absolutely right. Uh, the kind of commitments, I certainly agree with Mr. DeLand, if when we open the artery we've done nothing else, that would be a tremendous waste of an opportunity. But we're not talking about doing nothing else. We're talking about continuing all of the initiatives Al was just talking about so that this very large investment is not going to result in a sort of a whoopee, it's back to the 50s, let's all go out and buy the, the convertible and make believe we don't have to worry anymore. You have to recognize, if we want that kind of density in the downtown and that kind of economic future, it's got to be by people using public transportation. And I think we're saying people that, shot. Right? They don't do it That's now. That's not true. Right? They they check with Jim O'Leary. Those okay. numbers are going up. People will use public transportation. Mr. Breitmaker? Well, I think, you know, you asked the question to begin this evening about uh, 
private sector developers take on this. Um, all of this is the right kind of debate. I mean, I'll leave it to the engineers about what goes where and the geometry of all of that. The broader debate is, how's it going to work afterwards? And to restate Doug Foy's point, I think it's very important for us to figure out and to clearly understand that that which needs fixing should be fixed. And what the solution is, I leave it to the engineers in some ways. There's a broader fix that's needed in Boston, and that is that the roads didn't work before. And you fix the central artery, and you've still got a city that hasn't worked for a while. It used to be, it wasn't so long ago, that the absorption rate in the city was 600,000 square feet. You're looking at 2 million plus now as a figure. Those are jobs. Those are jobs for people. They are increasingly becoming jobs for people in Boston. The solutions have to be solutions that aren't car solutions. Or they are making sense of the roadways. I throw the, the question to the commissioner uh, here because I think Rick Domino is working on issues. New developments, if you, you look at those uh, jumps here in the city right now, are required to think about access. Those of us who um, either represent business or tenants and employees along the central artery are now working with the commissioner's office to put together commuter mobility programs. Those mobility programs, not unlike the water transportation business that started a few years ago as a mitigation effort, will find itself working into the overall warp and woof of how the city works, I think, in perpetuity. And I'd ask Rick about this because I think it's a very important point to make. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Joe, because the the point that Boston is a growing economy is something that I think the city and the region and the Commonwealth benefits. Um, I think that the fact that the economy extends itself, as Joe mentioned, more and more these days into our neighborhoods and into the region is something that we have to continue to foster. However, we need to continue to find other alternatives to get people into the city. Later, after I get done, I hope you talk to David Sol about fringe parking because we have some constraints right now in our fringe parking facilities in the region working with us to capture vehicles outside of the downtown core and finding alternatives with Mr. O'Leary and, and Fred and the water transportation to get these people into Boston. But the point that Joe raised relative to growth management is absolutely the point that Boston has taken steps on. An unprecedented action occurred last year when the growth management plan was put forward by the BRA and supported by the city that set height restrictions on all these buildings in the future that provided better access to our waterfronts. At the same time, put in requirements that that stated very specifically that any new development that occurs within the downtown must come before the city's transportation department and submit access plans that inform the city, inform the constituencies, our neighborhoods, et cetera, exactly how that new development will mitigate the impacts on our local street system, exactly what that development will commit to in terms of improving our transportation system. Rose Walk is a very good example. Here's, a, here's an example where we were able to build a new pedestrian access system to Rose Wharf, and at the same time, that system not only serves that development, but the regional water trans transportation facility that's there. Another good example, more and more developments are committing as high as 25% fee subsidies to the, their development plans when they come into Boston. The proposed plans regarding Fan Pier and Pier 4, which are, have radically changed, and the mayor has taken a very strong position in terms of transportation solutions to the four-point channel before that kind of development goes forward. That kind of development, even before we accept it, was already making commitments and providing and paying for bus service, providing and paying for water transportation service. That's radically changed since the years past. Before, the transportation issues were not on the, on the development table. Now they've taken a key role. Okay. Mr. Sol, do you think that the uh, communities in your region will respond to these requests to use public transportation? Is that a solution? I don't think there's any place to park right now. Uh, right now, the... Uh, they're running, uh, T parking stations are running at 95 to 100% capacity <coughs> by 7 o'clock in the morning. And one of the critical issues is that there's only 70,000 parking spaces in Boston. And there's 200,000 people fighting for those every day, and we can see the results of that. Uh, fortunately, in front of uh, Senator McLean's committee, we were successful in uh, uh, receiving an endorsement of a, a bill to exactly get that process started which would do a comprehensive look at the uh, need for parking facilities. Mr. King? Yeah. See, it's interesting that uh, most of what is being discussed is about getting people who are outside the city into the city. And a little while ago, we were talking about what kind of commitments there would be to get the people who lived in the city employed uh, both in the construction and on the, uh, in the jobs later on. And we didn't get to any kind of closure which would say to people out there who are listening, who hear all about this opportunity, that um, 
the secretary, uh, Alden, Massport, and those folks have a plan to put people to work. They have a plan to get people trained. And that's what we need to hear, because if you get the people who are in the city uh, trained, they're going to go using public transportation. So you have to factor this into all of the things that you're talking about with respect to dealing with the, the project. And I also find it incredible to hear that we give accolades to a project that we say is going to be obsolete when it's completed. There's something fundamentally wrong with that kind of thinking. But that aside, let's hear the answers on how you are going to get the people trained. Not committed, I mean actual facts. What can you tell the people out there uh, is going to be there? When's the training going to start? Where's it going to take place? So that they'll be ready to take advantage of these jobs. And Mr. Savucci, I want you to speak to uh, Ms. Puliano's community, uh, Ms. Riley's community, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ravica's community, because they're saying that they have many young people who are unemployed, who are dropouts, who don't have the skills or training, and yet you have this great opportunity. Are you going to be able to solve their problem? Uh, we can provide a lot of opportunity. The dollars are committed to the training. We're worth working with the city for that the training to be there. But this is not a project that's going to be obsolete the day that it's open. Not let's let's with the first job. question first. I'm not going to let that one go, though. Well, right, we'll, we'll come accurate. back to it. We'll come back to it. But okay. Mrs. Riley let's and talk. Mrs. Puliano can tell the residents of their community jobs will be available in the next few no, years. No, training will be available. Right. We know the jobs. Where? We know the jobs are available in the construction industry Where? because of the growth that's going to be happening here. We're working with the city, and we've committed the funding for our training programs. The city already has some training programs. We're talking about expanding those programs. We're working with the building trades, asking them to open up the number of apprenticeships so that there's positions to go to. There are positions. Not every construction job has to be on this particular project. Many of these positions may be filled by people who move out of the maintenance jobs in the large institutions, like the hospital complex. So there are a variety of construction opportunities. The tightness of this market provides those opportunities. It's important that we change stereotypes. If we're going to convince young women that construction is a field that they can work in, it's not likely to be with a poster of a beefy fellow on a jackhammer, because that's not exactly the image that a young woman that's a junior in high school thinks of herself as. But if you say, hey, you don't have to be leaning on a jackhammer. You might be an electrician, or you might be doing finished carpentry, or you might not be working on the artery, but you might be working on jobs that are, uh, that are going begging in the hospital complex because a lot of those maintenance workers are overworking on the artery. So you've got to open young minds in the school system that there are opportunities there and provide the dollars for expanded training and work with the trades to open up those apprenticeships. That's what Governor Dukakis held a, a, a meeting of all those interested parties about four months ago. That's what Al has been working on since with Rick Tamino, with the mayor's help, with the Boston School Department. It, it takes a lot of work to make the training programs work, but we know that the opportunity is there if we can get the training, the basic math skills, the basic skills you need to be able to work in the construction field. The opportunity is definitely there. We're providing the training so that the kids in the neighborhoods closest will have a shot at it. That's well, not to preclude someone from New Bedford from bidding on their job. I'm 19 years old. I'm a dropout from East Boston. I hear this program tonight. Where do I go tomorrow to sign up for this training? We're talking about jobs that are coming two and three years off. The we're training. talking where about work the training. With the training, we're working with the Boston Job Center. We're working with the Boston schools. That's where we can we go. We want to get at the kids in school. We don't want them to drop out. We want them to get the message that one of the ways to have access to these jobs, you don't just stay in school because you're going to college. You need the skills you pick up in school, and you don't want to encourage kids to think that they can drop out and make big bucks on a construction job because it's not true. You can't get into the apprenticeship programs without that high school degree. So if the We're students to go tomorrow with, to talk to their high school counselors, they'll know something about these jobs. They won't yet, the but training. I think they when will. When will they know? I think they'll start knowing about it next fall because that's the cycle we're working on, Al. September 1988? Wow. September yeah. 1988? Yeah, we, in December, the governor convened a meeting, as Fred said, of the city, the building trades, the business community, many others, and asked us to get a report back to him uh, in four months' time. Uh, we're about to do that. What we've committed to 
on top of all the other training and education programs that are out there. And there are lots and lots, and very often they're not well known or understood uh, by the people who need them. But there's a lot going on out there. On top of all of that, uh, we're making a $2 million a year commitment just around training people and making sure they know about the training opportunities and the placement opportunities, because you're right, that's every bit as important. They have to know about it in the first place. Outreach and recruitment is really critical, both for the on-site construction jobs and there are going to be thousands of jobs servicing this much construction. All the architects, all the engineers, all the accountants, all the draftsmen, all of the people that produce all of the paper. Uh, there's not just 7 million cubic yards of earth. There's about 7 million cubic yards of paper uh, to service this many billions of dollars worth of construction. That's a part of the city's economy that's growing. It's going to have a spurt of growth to service this construction. And we're going to be on two tracks that we're going to coordinate very carefully. One, for the on-site construction jobs, the apprenticeship program, we're going to reach into the schools. We're going to reach into places that are very good at getting people who've dropped out of school through existing community organizations, through the city, and through others to find people and recruit them into the apprenticeship program. And we're going to do everything we can in the same kind of effort to get people who could be draftsmen or engineers or any of the other kinds of service jobs. And those have to come sooner, for the most part, recruited for this as well. Who's going to do that? There are institutions out there right now, wheels that don't have to be See, reinvented. See, that's, that's, it's not an appropriate answer. You say they're institutions. Well, if you See, one of the things that, uh, that people get confused by is the failure to come up with and say, OK, you got a training program. Where can they get trained? Uh, question, uh, where does somebody go tomorrow? Uh, we need to give them an answer. Otherwise, it's a real dodge to people. Uh, sure, you must want to, uh, to do something, but people hear this kind of thing uh, over and over again. And uh, we have to live with it in terms of uh, the frustration that, that we see. For example, uh, in order to get into the program in the um, Humphrey Center that the unions control, you have to be an apprentice. Uh, is that still going to be the case if people want to get those skills? Uh, if uh, right now they're not an apprentice, uh, how's this process going to work so that, in fact, we're not um, leading people down some path to frustration? One, one of the objectives you know, that we are absolutely interested in is getting youth <coughs> and people in the Boston, within Boston that are underemployed or unemployed absolute access into the job opportunities that we've created here. And we want the same type of commitments and training programs the commitment that we have to make sure exists is that people have access without any prerequisites, that all people have access to these jobs, and that the, the opportunity from the very beginning of their understanding and education to the access to these jobs is something that we take advantage of. Uh, so as far as Boston's concerned, there will not be any obstacles to the access of these jobs, and we will be encouraging the state to make sure that they're So when the training and the jobs are available, you will make certain that uh, Mr. Verbikas uh, Mrs. Riley, Ms. Puliano, Mr. Uh, King, and of course, uh, Representative uh, McLean, citizens outside of Boston, are notified that programs are available. This is where you go to sign up. This is where you get the training, and jobs will be available for Boston. In, in, in fact, one of the first parts of this program uh, will be the most obvious, and that'll be a very intense outreach program. There's no substitute for recruiting people. Let me give a partial answer to the question that Mel King asked as to where. Uh, we've just finished uh, the construction of the Southwest Corridor. Uh, we've finished the construction, uh, virtually finished, of Roxbury Community College. Uh, the Humphrey Center is sitting there as one of the most underutilized facilities uh, in, in the region that has to be central to this training program. Northeastern, Wentworth, they're all sitting, and this is just one example, within two MBTA stops of each other on the new orange line in the Southwest Corridor. One of the things we're going to do in cooperation with the city, the schools, and those private institutions, uh, and, and Chancellor Jennifer and Roxbury Community College, is to put together a coordinated effort so that everyone in Boston who has any kind of access, and with the MBTA and the new orange line, most people have access to the Southwest Corridor, that whichever of those institutions is right for that person, if they're within transit or walking distance uh, of, of, those, of those institutions, there'll be a tremendous emphasis on training people for this construction boom just in those institutions. And we believe we can do the same kind 
of cluster of institutions and opportunity elsewhere in the metropolitan area. It absolutely has to be an outreach kind of effort. You have to find people where they live. You have to reach them in their neighborhoods and communities. Uh, this is, we're talking about 14 or 15,000 construction jobs from all of these public projects. And that's a tremendous opportunity. And shame on us if we don't fill it with, with our folks. Will those from, same citizens be looking for jobs the moment the project's completed? The permanent jobs? Will there be permanent jobs? You're, you're talking about 15,000 jobs. Let's, what happens when you complete the artery? We'll be ready to build the fifth tunnel or whatever it is because we said it's out of obsolete. Yeah, that's so, Thanks for coming back that's to the issue of obsolete. Be, that's yeah, what they'll be looking okay. at. Mr. Sullivan, did you want to respond to the issue of whether or not this will, in fact, be obsolete by the time it's completed this in 1990? This is not going to be obsolete if we do our job properly. You have to look at this project in the Fair context enough. of the New England economy. Getting people into downtown Boston is something that's best done by public transportation, whether it's on water or rail or bus, or whether it's people walking because they live close enough to walk. But the Boston economy is doing well, as exhibited in that, in that model, because the regional economy is doing well. And Senator McLean's, uh, a, a firm down in Senator McLean's district that's trying to ship something to Logan Airport goes on a truck through Boston. Boston thrives in part because the hinterland thrives the capacity on this highway can't be wasted on one person per car going to downtown Boston. It needs to accommodate the cars and trucks that are going through the city as part of the economy, which the city benefits from. The, this expansion allows the Fan Pier and other expansion that Rick was talking about. You're talking about building a new back bay. Either the region continues to grow, uh, and it's this kind of transportation improvement, and this transportation improvement specifically, that allows that growth, or it doesn't. If we, if we invest in this manner and allow the city to continue to grow, then there are jobs constructing the new fan pier area, that whole area of the city. It's like building the back bay over again. So this isn't the last construction job. It's the last major opportunity to deal with regional infrastructure, which creates a framework within which there can be continued growth with reasonable environmental quality. And we've got to work together on that. Uh, but there is no reason for people to be coming one to a car into this part of the city. We've got a fine public transportation system, which is getting better. But it can't grow if the whole thing is gridlocked. But so this is not going to be obsolete the day that it's open, not if we've done our job right. But Fred, the thing that's, that's missing here, it seems to me, is the mechanism to guarantee that these do the job Excuse right. me, the and mechanism, the as you know, the mechanism is in place. No, I don't think it is, because I, I would, if you were in charge of growth controls in this city, I think the mechanism would be in place, but you're not. You're in charge of trying to catch up with all the growth that's happening and make sure that people can get there. The, the thing that's missing is, no, you can't build enough roads to sustain all the growth that everyone has in their mind. Uh, somewhere along the line, somebody has to sit down and say to themselves, and I, I defy anyone in this room to tell me, if we build this road and if we do all these other transportation improvements, how much capacity will we have to spend on more cars or more transit or more buildings? How many buildings, how much square footage can Boston actually build to fill up that capacity? I, the answer does not exist. And the problem is that no one is trying to figure out that answer. What happens is that the development just sort of springs like weeds around the countryside if you and the transportation people in the city were in charge of telling people where buildings could go and how much you can build, I'd have more confidence that we will do the job right 10 or 15 years from now. But at the moment, that doesn't happen. At yeah, the I moment, you build the buildings willy-nilly. Mr. Rubik? One way that uh, we tried to work with Commissioner Domino's office on that is uh, instituting a packing freeze specifically in South Boston and in Boston in general. It was around this time last year that we must have had um, a number of speculators that proposed about 10 or 12,000 parking spaces in South Boston, anticipating the work that was going to be accomplished on Fan Pier and uh, the need for additional parking with the increased uh, access to the city with the new roads. And I did work with Commissioner Domino's office, and we instituted a parking freeze in the area. That will prevent a lot of future cars from coming in and parking in residential neighborhoods and either walking to downtown or just taking a short ride. Mr. DeLeo? I think Doug's posing precisely the right question that we need to plan for growth. And speaking to Fred's question of, of obsolescence, that if we plan, that it need not be obsolete uh, at, at open. But it's going to be close there, too. I think we, we've got to recognize 
that the end, end result is not going to be a finding of the fountain of youth for the city of Boston, but a bit of bypass surgery that's going to enable us to creep and beep along at our current pace. And if that's right, then we have to look more broadly at what are some of the other end results. Who's going to control the air rights over the artery once it's depressed? In my mind, it ought to be a park, not just any park, but it ought to be the crown jewel of Olmsted's emerald necklace. Well, that won't happen unless commitments are made right now. Are so we creating excuse a second me, Mike. nightmare, Mr. Deland? I don't. Just I don't think. Is this artery being repeated ten years later? I don't think it necessarily has to be, but we're we're on that step unless we make some upfront commitments right right now. Well, I've raised the I question seen of master that. planning, and unfortunately. Uh, Steve Coyle isn't here because I think he has a message on that. Uh, the BRA has undertaken that recently. I'm not sure of the current status, but I know there is a great deal of concern in the mayor's office and within the BRA for just these concepts. The uh, impact zone uh, proposal, there are many others that have been floated, and I think they're now at the drawing boards, as I understand it, for some Good master planning, uh, which uh, hasn't really occurred in Boston since uh, Ed Logue's period, I think. It goes back that in far. In fact, Harold, if you look at this model, the planning agency of the city, which is the BRA, in fact has those air rights as a park. Right. And I think that absolutely indicates our commitment to the idea that we are absolutely looking forward to future land uses as that may be created by the Ottery Tunnel Project and making those land uses become public benefits we need to make sure that those land uses in terms of their future are dealt with with the neighborhood's support and their participation. But there is, in fact, a growth management plan in effect in Boston. Harold's absolutely right. The transportation issues have been brought into the picture. We are now absolutely directing growth as it relates to transportation for the first time. Now the planning agency and the transportation area planning agencies are doing a land use and transportation plan in the Four Point Channel area. And that's come as, as a result of the kind of insistence that Doug Floyd has brought to the table. The other issue is how do we make this all work while we build upon the mass transit opportunities uh, for Boston. I agree with Tony Lee. We need to get people to start thinking about other ways of getting into the downtown. That's going to be extremely important in the future. Ms. Pugliano? I'd like to say just one word on the subject of the air rights. And to those of you who live in the sub suburbs, it's very easy to say, let it be another Olmstead Park. We like open space in the inner city. But remember, you're going to need people to work your hotels, work your, into your, in your office buildings. We need affordable housing. We've given up a lot of housing for the artery and for some of these other programs. You're going to have, you can't bus people in to work in these places. So let's take it easy with the idea of a, another Olmstead Park in the middle of the city. And well, beyond Olmstead that, Mr. Uh, Sabucci, the community is concerned about what are you going to do about the million rats? What are you going to do about moving the dirt? And what are you going to do if, in this whole process, you discover next year a great archaeological find that says, <laughs> uh oh, let's stop? This whole thing could be uh, derailed, can't it? I think that's very unlikely. Uh, but this, possible. This area, right? Anything is possible. This area is pretty well known. There will be archaeological digs that will be started this spring. They were done by the MBTA in Harvard Square, an area of similar age. You find some interesting artifacts on the Cana Project in Charlestown. We found some of the original foundation blocks of the original uh, House of the Legislature in Massachusetts. They're very interesting. They've been stored. They'll be relocated in a park in a proper setting afterwards. But you're not likely uh, to find anything you're not going to find an Aztec temple down there that's going to block the project. You'll find that's not a major concern. <laughs> you'll, 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 find, you'll find some interesting pottery and stuff that people will be interested in displaying. It's an important part of our history and culture, and that'll be nice, as it as it happened in Harvard Square, as it's now happening in, uh, in, in City be Square, Charles. Dig tomorrow now. Yeah. But the no, I, I think the digs are going to be interesting, and they're going to start later this year. But to, to Emily's point, and I, I think she knows it. There's a, a real opportunity here at the front end of this project to pin down the kind of commitments and more than commitments to get into concrete and brick and mortar some of the things. The, the replacement parking for the merchants that we've been uh, working on, that facility has to go into place before 
the existing parking lot is disrupted. What that means is the north end, which is now cut off from the city by the central artery, will re-expand. And that marketplace, ground floor market with parking upstairs, will re-expand the north end to the Congress Street boundary to take back some of what was taken away from the north end. When the discussion <coughs> happens on what goes on air rights, which is about to begin as soon as we pin down the ramp locations, we're open to recommendations from the city and the community about whether it should be a park or whether it should be housing. The one commitment that's decided, based on a lot of neighborhood input and city input, is that it will not be high rise. We're not building it strong enough to hold up anything more than four to six stories high. If the community decides they want that to be a park with the city, we're very open to it being a park. If the decision is it should be low rise housing, that's where it'll come out. It will not be high rise. It will be in scale and character. But we're open to park or we're open to development. And it might not be the exact same solution at Chinatown or the waterfront or the North End. Those are different communities. They have different needs for land. And what we're trying to do is knit the city back together. But those answers will be forthcoming before the digging begins. And in many cases, the physical construction will occur before the digging begins because the very first thing we're going to do in South Boston is that truck route. South Boston's going to know they either got or didn't get the truck route before the tunnel construction begins. And they'll know that, the, that it's there because that's a real commitment. The North End will know that that replacement market and parking facility will be built before the parking is taken away. So there'll be delivery at the front end on these kind of things. We will know that we've succeeded or failed. And I think we're going to succeed in having good training programs in place before the construction begins. So the communities are going to know that that part of the process is working at the front end. The part that we've all got to work together on, we've got to work together on that. But to be sure that these longer range issues, like a parking freeze to make sure that this new highway capacity isn't wasted on trips to the downtown, we've got to make sure that that happens at the front end too. So we're not looking at each other 10 years from now and saying, why did we do it? But I think the communities will know that they've got delivery before the big construction begins. Okay. And I think, well, okay. We, we all will. agree Boston is a livable city. It was, it is, and we should work towards making it a livable city in the years ahead. Well, that's exactly what we intended to do tonight. I think we've come a long way in discussing some of the grand concepts of the development of the Central Artery and the Third Harbor Tunnel. We'll take a station break now, and we'll come back and discuss the cleaning up of the Boston Harbor. Thank you. We've discussed the massive project to renovate the Central Artery and the Third Harbor Tunnel. And now we'll turn to the massive project designed to clean up the Boston Harbor, a project that will cost billions of dollars and that is a result of some court orders. We'll now see a tape discussion of that harbor cleanup by Carmen Fields of the 10 o'clock news. Boston Harbor puts a brave face forward, but surfaces lie. And it's easy to forget what lies below, the filthiest harbor in the nation, thanks to a deadly and daily assault. 500 million gallons of liquid sewage, 70 tons of solid sludge, another ton and a half of toxic chemicals flow into the harbor each and every day. It's a sickening sight from above, a thickening film up close. And all of it supplied by the 43 cities and towns as far north as Wilmington, as far west as Framingham, as far south as Stoughton, all of whose pipes lead straight to the Boston Harbor, a harbor that gets worse with every rinse and every flush. Our cesspool, quite simply, is the sea, and it shows. Boston fish have the highest incidence of liver cancer and fin rot on the East Coast. 2,000 acres of clam beds have been closed, and the state of our shoreline is shameful. So when I got close, I realized that the hundreds of turrets on the sandcastle were actually plastic tampon applicators, and this little child very innocently was making such a compelling uh, statement about how far we'd really gone and how bad the situation really was. 
That was 1982, and Bill Golden took his disgust to Suffolk Superior Court. Acting for the city of Quincy, he sued the MDC. That's the agency that was directly responsible for the harbor's health. The case was heard by Judge Paul Garrity, and what he found was this, an antiquated sewer system leading to two inadequate sewage treatment plants, one on Deer Island, one on Nut Island. Under the best of circumstances, they could render only the most primary of treatment. Underfunded and understaffed, they were little more than a gesture. Breakdowns were so commonplace that in 1982 alone, an additional 4.3 billion gallons of raw sewage spilled directly into the harbor. Uh, when we filed the lawsuit on behalf of Quincy, uh, there was no significant constituency left for the harbor. And what I mean by that is people had stopped believing in Boston Harbor. The need for a new harbor agency was indisputable. In the spring of 1984, the governor filed a bill to create one. By winter, the legislature still hadn't acted, so Judge Garrity did, with a bold threat to halt all development. Well, the legislature jumped, and the Water Resources Authority was born. The court case is a very important factor in what we're doing. There's a court order with a very detailed schedule that has to be met. The mission is massive, and the timetable, established now by a federal court, lasts through the turn of the century. These are the elements. First, a huge new primary treatment plant must be built on Deer Island, as large as Seabrook. Construction will last five years, starting in 1990 and lasting through 1995. A year later, workers will begin building an ocean outfall tunnel, the largest and longest the country has ever seen. It will start at Deer Island and extend eight to ten miles offshore, as wide as the Callahan Tunnel and six times as long. Once completed, it will carry treated sludge far out into the ocean for dumping. In the meantime, as an interim solution, treated sludge will be barged first to Quincy, then taken by train out of state. By 1995, a final site will be chosen and a permanent facility built. The same year that's done, Deer Island will break ground once again for a second new facility, the secondary treatment plant. And secondary treatment is key to the ultimate goal, a swimmable, fishable harbor by the year 2000. So that, yes, people will be able to go swimming and they won't get sick the way they get sick now. The logistics of accomplishing that are almost as mind-boggling as the cost. Estimated at $3 billion now, inflation could cause the price tag to swell. But the real bottom line is we have no choice. Boston has been a flagrant violator of federal clean water laws for years. Congress passed the Clean Water Act back in 1972. Among other things, it required that sewage undergo a more thorough and more expensive processing called secondary treatment. Now, most major cities began building such plants in the 70s, but not Massachusetts. Instead, the Dukakis administration applied for an exemption from the requirement. They applied in 78 and again in 1984. That was a judgment we made uh, based on our on our best judgment at the time as, as to what seemed to make sense and the financial condition of the Commonwealth. Yes, secondary treatment would have been costly, but here's the catch. Back then, the federal government was picking up 75% of the bill. Today, those funds are gone. And so we're proceeding with what, as you know, is going to be a very expensive but essential and necessary uh, program. And as big as it is, it's just beginning. More like a century's worth of work lies ahead. Um, a very interesting question for the state for future years is what do we do about all the stuff that's at the bottom of the harbor that we know about, the PCBs and whatever else. Um, and that's a problem that will have to be dealt with through the 21st century. We'll now discuss the process of cleaning up Boston Harbor which is reported to be one of the dirtiest harbors in the nation. Senator Golden, you like to jog, don't you? <laughs> yes. Can you tell us about your experiences jogging on these beaches of Boston? Well, Charles, it was a uh, summer morning in 1982. I lived in the city of Quincy, and it was my habit or custom in the morning to jog along the beach around sunrise. This particular morning, it was obviously going to be a very, very hot day. It was dead low tide. 
And as I was running along, I looked down about two miles of beach, and I saw what I thought was a phenomenon of jellyfish having come in and gotten stranded between mean high and mean low water for as far as the eye could see. Uh, as I jogged down that beach and got into what I thought was jellyfish, I realized uh, to my re revulsion that what I was stepping in was raw human feces and grease balls that had washed up during the night and uh, that in a few hours we were going to have young kids from the communities surrounding this area down swimming in this water. Uh, it was a, uh, a site that uh, not only made me extremely angry but motivated me to uh, go to the mayor of the Quincy uh, at the time I was city solicitor and uh, ask him to begin a project to, uh, to stop uh, this pollution. Was this a one-time occurrence? Uh, no, it had happened before. In fact, what's happened with Boston Harbor is that over the years, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Uh, I think on this planet, we're in transition from a life-supporting environment uh, to a life-threatening environment. And uh, the people's exhibit number one in this area is Boston Harbor. Uh, it's a disgrace. It's outrageous. Many people have given up on it, uh, and I think we should have to do something about it, and that's uh, what we're in the process of doing now, of course. Mr. Foy, is it as bad as uh, Senator Golden describes it? Oh, it's certainly that bad. Uh, it, it is, without question, the most polluted harbor in the country. It is the largest sewerage system in the country that has not come close to meeting federal law. Uh, the level of discharges into the harbor every day are... Uh, really truly mind-boggling on the orders of hundreds of millions of gallons um, and billions of gallons of raw sewerage over the years. Uh, so there's no doubt that the harbor is grossly polluted. It really, it, although it's quite a lovely resource to look at, uh, it's totally unusable for the, the people that live in the city, for the kids that would otherwise maybe go to the beaches and swim. They f find beaches such as Bill um, suggests. Uh, uh, so it's, it's not only un unpleasant, but it, it is unhealthy for people to be near the harbor. Dr. Kaufman, how unhealthy is it, not just for people, but for uh, species that live in the ocean, in the harbor? Well, the tampon applicators and the human feces that Bill referred to are only the visible signs of pollution. The release of untreated human waste has contaminated shellfish beds and beaches with disease-causing organisms. The release of our complex organic chemicals into the water, both from the home and from industry, has caused a very high rate of cancer in the fishes. And the release of heavy metals, again, both from the home and from industry, substances like copper and cadmium and zinc, have so contaminated the sediments that the concentrations are high enough in some places to kill marine organisms outright. Almost of as great concern as the pollution that we can measure out there is the absence of the information we need to manage and direct a cleanup of the harbor. Cleaning up the harbor is going to be like a surgical operation. And like any doctor, we're going to need eyes and ears to check our progress. But there's as yet no monitoring or basic research program comprehensive enough to provide the information we need to direct this enormous project. Is there likely to be an ep economic impact as a result of the pollution of the harbor? Does it affect the fishing industry? Does it affect jobs? Does it affect any uh, health of uh, Certainly. It's a large number. It's a difficult one to measure because the fishing industry is both commercial and recreational. We take lobsters and crabs from the harbor as a commercial fishery, but recreationally, Many people go to the harbor to fish, primarily for winter flounder. They rent boats, they buy fishing equipment. People like to swim in the harbor, still, incredibly. And many people go out to the islands to, uh, for recreation. This is the best place for our urban peoples to find rest and relaxation. And the fact that it's in such a state is, is a disgrace. Well, I take my children out to fish for flounder. Are you telling me that that's a, a risky uh, a project that maybe I should reconsider? I don't think fishing for flounder is risky. As for <laughs> eating the flounder, the concentrations of toxic substances in flounder flesh are certainly measurable. As yet, it's not high enough to cause immediate uh, health concern, but give it time. Okay. So we can't fish, and if we catch them, we can't eat them. Or should not I eat have them. stopped eating fish from the harbor. Okay. Mel King, can we swim on these beaches? Um. 
increasingly, uh, people have been uh, finding some access. Uh, but, you know, it's a mixed bag. Uh, uh, you fight to get access to a uh, polluted uh, harbor. And uh, so you say, well, uh, is it worth it? Uh, I think the principle of uh, fighting to make sure that you're not denied access to uh, anything, anywhere, uh, is what's important. Um, it isn't easy, and it gets more difficult as um, you look at the condos that go up, as you look at the control uh, of access that is there by uh, the people with the money. And so uh, you see a situation where uh, billions of dollars are going to be put into uh, making this a uh, enjoyable and a clean place, and it may be that the people who live in the city aren't going to be able to uh, get access to the waterline uh, anyhow. So cleaning the harbor is not going to solve the problem of the residents of the South End? Uh, not at all. And I, obviously there's another problem that the people in the South End and all of Boston have, and that is that they pay a uh, big share of the cost of uh, cleaning it up. And, um, and there's got to be something that's done about that. Uh, you have uh, people who don't have access and who are at the same time uh, being forced to pay uh, to, uh, to clean it up for the access of people who have uh, much more money and resources than, uh, than they have. Okay. Mr. Garrett, you've been affectionately called the uh, troubleshooter in this instance. You were involved in this air issue of Clean Up the Harbor some time ago, is that right? Yeah. It was a pretty easy case, at least in terms of liability. The condition of the harbor was in clear violation of the Federal Clean Water Act of 1972 and more state environmental laws that you could shake a stick at. The tough part was figuring out how to go about getting it cleaned up. Do you put the harbor in receivership? I think that's probably destructive of democratic processes. Uh, do you keep the same agency in charge, the MDC? That didn't work. So, Why didn't it work? What was wrong with the MDC? Uh, trouble with the MDC is that the political branches in this state tried to keep a tether on the MDC in terms of money and jobs for political purposes, which I suggest they're trying to do right now with the Mass Water Resources Authority, and that's going to be the challenge to keep them away from it. But the ultimate solution was to set up an independent agency, the Mass Water Resources Authority, to give it the money, the tools, and I stress the independence to do the job. That independence is in jeopardy right now, and Paul Levy needs a lot of support to keep it independent. Well, Mr. Levy, sounds like you've uh, inherited a parade of horribles. You have a solution for us? <clears throat> we have a solution. This is uh, the biggest plumbing job the state's ever going to see. You know, the byproduct of what we're going to do is to clean up Boston Harbor, but the real problem is that 40, 43 communities in the metropolitan area are illegally polluting because the sewer system is broke. It's just like if the sewer pipe coming out of your house were discharging onto your front lawn, you'd want to fix it. We have the sewer pipe from two and a half million homes in the metropolitan area discharging into our front lawn. Does the community know that? They're learning. About a year and a half ago, we did a survey. We found that fewer than 25% of the people knew where it went when they flushed the toilet. Most people would say it went down. Well, well that was my <laughs> assumption. <laughs> so when I flush my toilet... It does it go down, and then it goes out. Into the harbor. Every toilet, every sink discharges from Framingham and Ashland, from the west, from Stoughton to the, to the south, uh, Wilmington to the north, Wilmington to the north. They all end up in Boston Harbor. What are you going to do to solve that problem? Well, we have a big construction job. We have uh, a massive sewage treatment plant to build, a number of tunnels, the, the fourth and fifth harbor tunnels, as you will, <laughs> uh, to handle some of the, the sewage waste and the effluent from the plant. Uh, we have to find some sludge processing sites. The sludge is the, the solid material that comes out of a sewage treatment plant. We're hoping to recycle that sludge and make fertilizer out of it. We have to figure out how to pay for all that, <clears throat> because paying for it, if it all comes from the ratepayers, will quadruple the water and sewer bills in the metropolitan area. And Representative Hayes has a very good bill pending before the legislature to help uh, have the, the state help pay for some of that, that effort, not only ours, but around the, around the Commonwealth. But it's a big effort. There's a big educational campaign that has to be done. People have to understand that this is not just a Boston Harbor problem. This is a sewer system that's broken. Representative Hayes, do you have an uh, answer to this problem? Well, I, I think that the first thing that needs to be noted is that it's not just a Boston Harbor cleanup, that uh, 
Boston Harbor has a court order, but it's one community that has a, a court order, and there are many others, unfortunately, in the Commonwealth that have court orders. If you tally those all up and, and you add to that court order list uh, enforcement orders and permit requirements, you're going to get a figure in the order of $3 billion worth of outstanding work that's going to need to be done in the next four to five years. That, I think, given the reality of the federal phase-out, the federal government is getting out of the business. They're not going to be providing the 75 percent that was mentioned earlier. Uh, that is going to require a massive, aggressive state involvement, and that's what is being proposed uh, at the state level right now, and I'm optimistic that we'll get that job done. And what will your bill specifically do? Will the, will the state pay for this massive project? Specifically, it will step in, essentially, and, and take the place of the federal money that's going to be gone. And it sets up a uh, response to the requirement for a revolving loan program. The federal government requires that we set up a revolving loan program. And it also sets up a grant program. Uh, together, those two programs will provide uh, approximately 75 percent funding for the Boston Harbor cleanup and other cleanups that are mandated in other parts of the Commonwealth, in, in Plymouth Harbor, in Gloucester, in Springfield. Those people also need relief, and that's what this bill will do. It sets in motion a competitive statewide program, and Paul Levy recognizes that on a competitive basis, his agency and the cleanup of Boston Harbor is going to be at the top, and they will get the bulk of those funds in the next few years. Do you have enough money, Mr. Levy? Well, the way the, uh, the statute was written, the authority has the ability to set its own rates to meet the, uh, the revenue requirement, the amount of money we need to pay off the bonds that we have to issue to finance this project. And uh, as Judge Garrity was saying, I think that's a, a very important uh, step that the legislature took. The, uh, we're dealing here with a federal court order that, with which we have to comply. If we, if we don't comply with it, we'll be subject to fines from the federal government, penalties, possible moratorium on sewer hookups. Um, and, and the cost of not doing this job is even higher than the cost of doing it. Mr. Delan, are you looking over Mr. Levy's shoulder to make sure he's doing his job? You bet he we, is. we are. <laughs> <laughs> Very what, closely. What? And there is a federal court, court order, and one that I'm convinced uh, will, will be met, and perhaps uh, given uh, Paul's enthusiastic leadership, uh, exceed it. But I think the broader question that we need to ask is why are we cleaning up Boston Harbor? And there's some, there ought to be a reason that goes deeper than just to comply with federal law. Now, admittedly, it has been a gross violation of state and federal law for over a decade. The harbor should have been cleaned up by 1977. And here we are in 1988, and the final cleanup won't come until the turn of, turn of the century. But why are we really cleaning up Boston Harbor? And it goes to our vision for Boston. What's the future of Boston going to hold? What's the recreational? commercial uh, mix of the in, in the harbor. Uh, what, what are we going to see? We, I wish Dave Davis were still here. He's at this moment uh, running some lobstermen out of town. Well, one of the reasons <laughs> to clean up the harbor is to resuscitate the commercial fishing industry. So we need to think about what the shape of the harbor is going to be, not just tomorrow, but 30 years down, down the road. Well, are you suggesting that this multi-billion dollar project doesn't have a broad goal and specific purpose in mind? Well, I think there, there are certainly goals to comply with a court order, but I, I su suggest that it's incumbent upon all of us to think more broadly about why we're really doing it and, and how we can reshape the future of Boston, because that's what it's at stake, the livability of the city. Mr. Hoyt, you're on the board that uh, I guess supervises what Mr. Levy's doing. Does the board have a vision of what uh, this harbor cleanup will involve? Certainly. Uh, beyond, obviously, again, meeting uh, the re environmental requirements laid out in uh, federal laws and state laws and um, in the court order, we clearly see Boston Harbor as, a, as a, a, a true resource for not only Boston and the metropolitan area, but really for the whole Commonwealth. Uh, we've talked about the economic resources associated with a fishing industry, both commercial and, uh, frankly, recreational. Uh, urban centers need to have strong recreational opportunities. Uh, the beaches surrounding Boston Harbor should be available, actually not only for the uh, children of the city of Boston, but really for people all through the region. We talked about uh, the revitalization of Boston in terms of the uh, economic activity that's there. Uh, while we need to be clear that there is plenty of access to the harbor for everybody involved, we also know that 
Boston's got to be the kind of place where both businesses and, um, and residences want to be located. And I think part of that is having a, a, um, a, a quality harbor. Well, how do you respond to Mr. King's concern? He sees this harbor as another project that's bypassing the community it's designed to serve. If you clean up the beaches, people will buy that condo property and be <clears> available <throat> to a limited number of citizens. And he hasn't heard a commitment to jobs for residents of the city. Is that part of this plan? Certainly a commitment to, uh, to jobs is part of the plan, just as uh, with respect to the Third Harbor Tunnel and the um, Depression of the Central Artery. But with respect to um, access, again, to the harbor uh, for everybody, we have two very, at least two very, very important uh, processes in place, that actually, that I'm involved in that I think um, provide the mechanism for ensuring that. That's the uh, environmental impact review process where, as part of that, we require with respect to any proposed development in the waterfront area, that there be laid out a plan for providing public access, a plan that gets reviewed in great depth and actually negotiated with individual developers through a, the Tidelands licensing process or the so-called Chapter 91 process, which the legislature and the Dukakis administration uh, put into place. So that public access is a key element not only of what the Water Resources Authority, I think, stands for, but frankly, what the Commonwealth stands so for. So the beaches will be clean and available to the community? Absolutely. Mr. Key? Yeah. Um, you talked about an environmental impact. Um, I want to know what the economic impact is going to be. Uh, and I have the same question for you and Levy, Mr. Levy, about uh, uh, jobs and training and uh, how do people know, in fact, that they are going to uh, to take place, and I also want to ask a question about uh, about the board and its leadership. But let me just ask the question about the economic impact. If, because it's scary, um, you're going to have to make the people pay to clean up this harbor, uh, means there's going to be an increase in the cost of their housing, and we have a very high proportion of people whose incomes are low and moderate. How are they going to be protected? We see people getting displaced by uh, government action um, more so now than by uh, private action. So I want to know what you're going to do to protect the people so that the uh, exorbitant costs are not going to be borne by people who can least afford it. Well, let, me, let me address that. The first thing we're going to do is get the project done, because if we don't get the project done, the cost to the people is going to be even higher. When a federal court imposes a fine, it's those same ratepayers who are going to pay the money. And that's more expensive because the project will then get done under, under a judge's court order and his personal supervision. That's much more expensive. So the first thing we have to do is get the job done. Second thing is to remember that the retail rates are set by the cities and towns. It's those cities and towns that decide on the rate structure that's to be paid. Now, in Boston, They've already, already adopted a rate structure that says the more you use, the more you pay, so that the smaller users, the residential users, pay less proportionally than the bigger users. And I think that's part of what has to be done. The other thing I think uh, should be done, which is something I did well at the DPU, is to approve rates, a uh, lifeline kind of rate structure, so that people with low income and fixed income get a break on a, on a minimum amount of water that they need. Yeah, Third are you thing saying that, that you don't have any oversight, any ability to uh, make sure that and to watch what the cities and towns do with respect to the what it's completely out of your hands that's correct the way the legislature set up the, the authority we set a wholesale rate structure which is a certain amount per gallon and then the the cities and towns have to sit, set the retail rate so the, that's where the local activism is very important yeah but the, you can reduce the wholesale rate though we c we cannot reduce the wholesale rate we're, we're not allowed to have a rate that, that declines with usage, it's got to be a, at least a, a, a flat rate. But it's, it's the retail rate where, where that's uh, most effective. And as I said, Boston has done that. Some other communities have done that. Some other communities have noticeably not done that. And in fact, their residential customers are paying more proportionally, and they've got to fix that. The other thing those cities and towns need to do is to start billing their customers, the water and sewer customers, more regularly. Boston, once again, has already done this. But some towns bill twice a year or four times a year. If, if that's okay if you're paying a water bill of 150 or 200 dollars a year, but if it's up at five or 600 or more, you have to let people budget month by month for that. The final thing, and this gets back to Emmett Hayes's bill again, is we know that the rate making system, even if you do all that stuff, is inherently a regressive kind of tax, mm -hmm. and we know that the tax system is more progressive. 
And so to the extent that the state legislature feels comfortable funding some of these projects through the state, state tax system, then there'll be a more progressive uh, assortment of, uh, uh, or collection of that money. Let me ask Ms. Downey. Ms. Downey, does the mayor uh, support this project? Very definitely. Um, he worked um, on getting the <coughs> legislation passed. Um, he went out to uh, Deer Island after the authority was established and saw the problems that having the prison there um, created and he turned around and he said okay we're going to move the prison and he picked a site and it was in the South Bay area which was part of the South Boston South End neighborhood. Uh, then he turned around and he uh, donated 92 acres at Deer Island to the the MWRA through the state uh, for the construction of the prison for a dollar. Then he turned around and lobbied down in Washington uh, for the $100 million um, issue to help us out and also got the National League of Cities to take a stand that they hadn't done before to support that $100 million for Boston Harbor. Um, and also, um, with our Boston Water and Sewer Commission, we have lifeline rates right now. They're 15% for homeowners um, over the age of 65, and there is a proposal in front now to actually raise that to 20%. Um, we did do the inclining block rates. Um, because we established our Water and Sewer Commission in 1978, and we went through some um, pretty much rate shock with a lot of the residents at that point in time. Uh, but we're kind of ahead of the game now because we've done a lot of our capital program. We've actually um, saved 30% of our water, which we found through fixing the pipes in the ground. So that's in the saved, city? yes, mm -hmm. within the city because we were able to do our capital program. We're almost to the end of it. We've got about three more years of it. And then we're pretty much going to have a tight system. Um, the mayor's consistently been out front and help, helping to support the harbor. The other thing that um, the mayor has done, uh, which really ties in to this whole issue of the harbor cleanup and, and the rates and people having access to it, all you have to do is go out in the harbor once on a boat and fall in love with it. Uh, the islands are wonderful. And yeah, we have to clean it up, there's no question, but we have to have access for everybody in order for them all to be out there and see why they should pay these rates to clean it up. Um, he established a Harbor Park Advisory Committee uh, back in 1985, um, um, which I am the chair of, and it's a community group that's made up of neighborhoods, harbor users, and the business community. We review all the development which happens along the waterfront. Our key goal is to rezone the waterfront to protect areas for maritime uses for the lobstermen. We're rezoning certain working areas of our waterfront. The other part is when we're allowing mixed uses in certain areas to make sure that those developments build and maintain continuous public access, have public landings, have um, public docking facilities for com commuter boats. Um, we are trying now to tie in community sailing programs. We ran a courageous sailing program out of the Charlestown um, Pier 4 area um, this past year that, that was a great success and we had kids from all over the neighborhoods. Um, all, diff all different nationalities coming down to Charlestown um, and learning how to sail, and what it was a great program. Mr. Rank, can the governor to governor top that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he can at least match it. The, uh, the, there could not be a higher priority for Governor Dukakis. Uh, he has been in love with the harbor for a long time. Uh, the Harbor Island State Park, which about half the people who have preceded me have spoken about, uh, is an initiative that he began back in the mid-'70s, and as that begins to fully flower and fully come to fruition and people begin to use it the way they are now, uh, the governor and the mayor are collaborating uh, on a multi-million dollar terminal at Long Wharf uh, as the principal way that people will get out there in the future. Uh, that kind of stands as the beacon uh, of, of the vision that Mike DeLand spoke of, uh, of, of why we're not simply complying with a law, although we certainly have to do that, but restoring something grand for the people of of the city and the Commonwealth. Uh, it was Governor Dukakis who filed the legislation back in 1984, as your introductory tape uh, reminded people, that created MWRA. Uh, he and Judge Garrity and uh, a number of legislators of whom Emmett Hayes was one, uh, Secretary Hoyt and I uh, worked uh, a very long, hard year uh, to bring that legislation and MWRA into existence.
Congress. Uh, the hard work had only begun, obviously, uh, when that legislation was passed. Uh, very major decisions. Uh, the reciting of the Deer Island House of Correction, now the whole process of taking that on with a lot of help and support from the mayor uh, is something that the governor took upon himself when uh, when people wondered uh, if that facility could ever be relocated. Well, what about uh, that, though? I mean, that's a concern that I'm sure Mr. Levy has now. Your project can't move forward until that prison is relocated from Deer Island to South Bay, is that correct? No, we can go ahead with part of the project, but it gets in the way of the secondary treatment plant. But we can begin uh, construction of the primary plant in the meantime. But uh, whenever that prison is moved five years later is when we can get the secondary plant. Uh, but that's a big part of it, right? It's I mean, a very big part. We, uh, there's a bill pending before the legislature right now to permit the um, DCPO, uh, Tony Lee's old group, to... Uh, to uh, build that prison under a design-build form of, of construction, which means it could be out of the way in 91, which is... Paul, which if, if, your schedule, if his schedule is to be met, uh, that bill has to pass within the next month. Yeah, if I could the prison has to be moved by no later than December 31st, 1991. And if and not, you look at the history of moving prisons in the Commonwealth, then that would be an all-time <laughs> record break. Mr. Levy, sounds like a major problem. Well, it, if it's in the way, as I say, if it's in the way, we have problems building the secondary plant. The court order now provides for the secondary plant to be built in, by 1999. So, in a sense, the prison doesn't have to be out of the way until 94. We would like to expedite, however, the secondary plant and have at least part of it in place by 1996. Which What's would be holding up the prison being relocated from Deer Island to South Bay? The one thing that's holding it up right now is that bill is pending in the legislature, and the sooner it's passed, the better. Yeah. Representative Hayes, can you help us on that? Well, I think that uh, the legislature has some concerns. We have uh, in place an inspector general who uh, was created because of some prior abuse uh, on some contracts. And we are constantly under pressure not to short circuit a building procedure. And that's what we're hearing right now. And I think many of us in the legislature are concerned about the issues that he's raised, about the type of uh, building that they want to do. And you've seen it in the reluctance of the legislature to date to move that, that piece of legislation along. Well, Mr. DeLand saying if you don't act on the prison, the project is going to be delayed. There is no question about it. We have a tough, a tough dilemma here, and that is do we alter the, the construction procedures in order to meet some timetables? And I, for one, believe we're going to have to do that. The cost of, of this cleanup are enormous, and every week that we delay, you're adding on the backs of those ratepayers. The ratepayers, even with my bill going through at a level of $2 billion, which will be a challenge, are still going to see a dramatic increase. They are going to see rates that they have never heard of before in the greater Boston area. And to the extent that we delay the process and we delay getting the House of Corrections moved and we don't give him the tools that he needs at the MWRA, the price tag is going to go up even further. Could Mr. Garrity, how are we going to pass this impasse? Uh, I guess it's really... I'm hearing everybody loves the harbor. Uh, how much do they really love it? And uh, are they going to love it enough uh, to, uh, I would call it, to engage in enacting some reparations? Uh, back in 1972, when the Clean Water Act passed, uh, you could get uh, the, uh, the video said 75%. It was, I think it was 90% federal money. That money is phasing out right now because the political branches of government in this state didn't take advantage of, of federal money. And you, you might Who reasonably that? say... Who you, was that? Huh? Who was that? The state and the city. The states? Well, I mean, which administration? I mean, you know, whole, we keep... All of the administrations from 1972 to the present time failed to take advantage of that very, very large amount of federal money that was available. The so now the people are going to pay for you're, you're what exactly right. right. Yeah. And that's why there needs to be reparations today from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to keep those rates down so people won't have to take food off their table in order to pay for the water. We have to love the harbor that much. Representative Hayes? Yeah, let me just say that, I, uh, that uh, Judge, you're correct in one, in one statement. If you say that the MDC and those responsible for that system were unable to go forward, you're correct. But to suggest that prior administrations weren't using every dollar of federal monies coming in isn't correct, because the money was going out. It was coming in, the federal dollars were going out, but they were going out to other projects, because the old MDC was never able to go through all of those hurdles, jump through all the hoops, and get their projects up to the fundable list. They did a great job of talking about getting them forward, but they never got them to construction. Because the, the state wouldn't give the MDC the 10% money. It's that simple. Well, 
I agree with Paul on that, but I don't think it makes a lot of sense to engage in political archaeology at this point in time. Except for reparations. Uh, no, no, we've got, we've got a problem. We've got a dirty harbor. It's so dirty now that if you bring a bucket of the stuff out, if you throw it back in, you violate federal and state law. Uh, so, I mean, we've got a problem here. We've got to work on it. Uh, there are two aspects of this problem. One is a money problem. It's going to be one of the most expensive projects in the Northeast in the, in the history of this country. Uh, that's a difficult political problem. The heat is on politically. If we're going to handle that heat and finish the project that Paul Levy and all of us here would like to see finished, we've got to do two things. We have to, have to educate people as to why it's necessary to do the project, number one, which is the vision that Mike DeLand was talking about. Two, we've got to come up with the money. That vision and that money are linked together. This is not a Boston problem. It is not a Boston metropolitan problem. This is not just simply a local asset. It is, in fact, a state asset and a national asset. We need to do uh, what uh, Emmett Hayes has suggested. We have to jump in with the state and bring in state money to help out uh, the ratepayers that Mel was talking about. We've got to bring the feds back into this. Uh, we, can, we can toss stones all over, and we're very like, lucky here to have Mike DeLand as our regional EPA administrator. But where are the federal dollars? Where is the federal commitment today uh, to preserve this resource? If we were throwing waste into the middle of Yellowstone or in the middle of Bryce Canyon or any of our national other national parks, national resources, uh, the country would be outraged. This is a national resource. Uh, if we're going to be a world-class city, uh, a world-class state, if we're going to be integrated into a world-class economy, we've got to preserve our natural resources and that's a national goal, a state goal, and a city goal. But Bill, we're going to have to do it on our own. We blew it. The federal dollars are no longer there, and there's no reason to believe they're going to be there in the future. That's we, where I disagree with you. We have to pay for this ourselves. I disagree as well. I certainly disagree that we should accept that as a premise now, that a well, federal responsibility, which Bill described very well, is, well, is I th I simply think, off the table I, forever. I think it would be poor planning to delay any aspect of this and the expectation no, is going to be a that. federal bailout. No, no, I didn't say that at all. I think all. we have to face up to the responsibility of paying for this. It's going to be painful, but let's accept that as an opening proposition. If somehow or other that is modified by uh, federal programs in the future, fine. But right now, we have to address the, pay, uh, the the problem of paying that bill. So we shouldn't rely on any federal support at all. If it comes, Not it's great, opinion. but we, we've Harold got the responsibility. Is, is right. Right? I think he's right. Harold's right. We, we blew it. Uh, by not cleaning up Boston Harbor in the time frame required by federal and state law is the most expensive public policy mistake in the history of New England, if not if not the country. Again, and we, who blew it? The governor? Well, the past the administrations, mayor, but I, I don't think that's a, I mean, a the, useful, the useful exercise to look back in, in that well, archaeological. A collective well, gaggle of governors and legislators. Right, well, I, let's, not, let's not limit this to Massachusetts. <laughs> Remember that when right. the initial lawsuit was filed by our, our friends over here, the EPA was named as a defendant in the case also. Now, when Mike arrived, he managed to switch sides and became a plaintiff. <laughs> and, you know, I've frankly been trying to do the same, but it wouldn't leave any <laughs> in the case. But, but remember, I, I think the EPA was considering that waiver request for, what, seven years, Mike? This was before you got there. And, and if I were a governor during that time and, and I saw other states and other municipalities around the country getting waivers, and my best technical advisors were telling me, well, a waiver seems sensible given the cost effectiveness of secondary versus other things, and given some financial crises that the state was going through in the 1970s, that, does that decision now look so bad? Well, now, it, wait, wait, yes. wait, Paul. Yeah. No yes, other major bad. city in this country got, got a waiver. The waiver <coughs> provision was an aberration of the 77 amendments designed for West Coast cities where the discharge is off the Outer Continental Shelf in the thousands of feet of, of water. And even the, the waivers applied for out there were denied. Los Angeles was denied a waiver. So the reason that EPA sat on, on the waiver was nobody in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was asking EPA, EPA to process it. Who is our discharge? Where are we discharging? Where are we discharging? We're discharging into about 20 feet of water. Yeah. Let's keep our eye on the ball, Mike. We can engage in this political archaeology, but today it's the federal government that has set the standards for how clean this harbor should be. They have set that as a value. Let's ask the federal government to put their money where their mouth is. It's not just good enough to be a tough regulator. 
You should jump into the game on the money side of things, and the federal government has to reorder its priorities so that the environment, again, is a priority in this country. Well, the federal government has spent 40 billion bucks of taxpayer money, you and my taxpayer money, cleaning up harbors that, around this country. And the federal government now, in the Graham Rudman uh, era of austerity, is looking to hazardous waste and looking to other environmental problems. And I think irrespective of who's sitting at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue or what the composition of the Congress is, we're not going to see another massive federal public works program for, for cleanup of cities. Uh, that protecting our environment isn't a one-shot deal, Mike. It's an in endeavor that goes on and on and on. And it's one we can't forget, and it's one we can't give up. It seems to me I, I have a strong interest in, in, in that argument, but I must say I agree with Harold. It seems to me it's not helpful to fight over whether we can or cannot get federal money. Everyone here will agree that if we could get federal money, it would be nice. We certainly would like to have somebody help bail us out of this bind, but we are in a bind. We are going to have to do this job. We're going to have to find the money, and I think at the moment we've got a plan for the fact that the money is going to come from inside the state, that we're going to, the city and the towns and the state are going to have to find it. If we can later get the feds to come back into the game and come up with some serious dough, that'll be great. Mm -hmm. I agree with Mike DeLand. I doubt that that's going to happen. This is Seoul. Or how, what about the people in your community? Are, are they prepared to fund this project? Uh, I, th I think we've got some real problems here. Uh, I think one of the things that people aren't aware of is that there's 44 systems here. There is a wholesaler system, and then there are a number of individual community systems mm -hmm. that are feeding the wholesaler. And that, what we've heard tonight, is that there are f now 43 separate rate-making bodies that are going to have to have an impact here. I'd say the communities, uh, many people are not aware where this stuff goes. That's a second issue, that they don't know that there's 44 systems, they don't know where it's going. They're not aware of how that harbor belongs to all of us. Uh, MAPC, uh, my organization, did the original Harbor Island study that, that led to the creation of that. That was a metropolitan-wide effort. It was a recognized resource. A lot of people don't know how much they use. They don't know how much they're using the system because there aren't meters that adequately tell people that. And particularly low-income folks are going to get really hit between the eyes, not just the people who live in the city, but the people who live around the metropolitan area. And they're not aware, I don't think, of how they can reduce their own use. I mean, we have companies that have reduced their use of water by 80% just because of the economic value of that. And I think there are a number of things that people have to have to recognize. I think we ought to take advantage of every dollar that, that's available from uh, the more progressive tax structures if they're available. But I think that's going to be a critical issue. Dr. While Parker. we're on the subject of dollars, if we assume for argument's sake that the money is going to come from home, it makes it all the more important that this vision for how clean we want the harbor is absolutely clear and absolutely specific. Now, when my colleagues and I as scientists have been asked to comment on the efficacy of this or that part of the cleanup plan, we find ourselves at a loss because we don't think there is a really clear and specific notion of exactly what our goals are in cleaning up the harbor. We want it swimmable, but swimmable where? We want it fishable, but what is it that we want to be able to fish for? And no one's asked the question of what sorts of other creatures we want to see in the harbor. I'm always asked what will come back. I have no idea because I haven't seen really specific goals set forth on when the project is finished. And until we know that, we will not know what it's going to cost. Mr. Levy, can you respond to some of those well, goals? Well, that's very true. If you look at the Boston Harbor in Massachusetts Bay compared to Puget Sound, say, in, in Seattle or... Uh, or in Maryland, uh, Chesapeake Bay, it, it's remarkably unstudied and unknown. And, and we have to do a lot to catch up on that. Um, uh, Dr. Kaufman is, is correct on that. Um, I wouldn't want people to think, though, that because we don't have that information, we can afford to wait on carrying out this court order. That but has they, to take place anyway. Paul, the issue I'm addressing is not how to start the project. We all know how to start it, and the scientists want to stay out of the way. The plant has to be built. Your plan is wonderful. We have to affect it. But we do want to know when it's over with. I agree completely. Uh, we have a big issue, for example, right now on the, the CSOs, the combined sewer overflows. Don't explain what those are. Those are the relief valves on the sewer system, basically. When it rains, the relief valves let go into the harbor, into the Neponset River, the Charles River, and the Mystic River. Raw sewage goes into the harbor out of those relief valves. Every time we have a heavy rain. When there's a heavy rain. And right. there's no way to control that at all. Not right now. 
And one of the things we have to come up with at the MWRA over the next year or so is a plan for dealing with the CSOs. Now, part of the problem in coming up with that plan for the CSOs is we don't know by what standard we're going to be judged. In other words, how clean is that water have to be that's coming out of the CSOs? How much of the storm water do we have to capture? Do we have to capture every storm? Well, every storm in 100 years, every storm in six years, what's the standard? That gets to exactly the points Dr. Kaufman was, was mentioning. How clean is clean? How clean should we get it? And those, it's very difficult to do financial or, or engineering planning when you don't know the answers to those questions. So you can answer Dr. Kaufman's questions and Mr. DeLand could tell you what the standards are. Well, Mr. DeLand and also the state DEQE have to come to an agreement on that. There's a federal and a state role there. We can do that, can't we, Mr. DeLand? We can. In we the have, interest of the community? We have a little squabble with the state at the moment, but we can, we can work that out. <laughs> we can that, put that aside for the greater good of Boston. That shouldn't impede uh, Paul's, Paul's planning. And, but Paul's planning, I think, not only has to look at how clean is clean, but it has to look at how he can integrate his uh, project with the one we discussed uh, earlier. He mentions the CSOs. The depression of the artery will intersect uh, virtually all of those 108, now they've been reduced, I believe, to 88 CSOs. <coughs> Does it not make sense at the time the artery is being built to capture those flows, consolidate them, so which you'll have to do to ultimately uh, treat them? Do it at that time. If that is feasible, I would suggest that <coughs> many, many millions of dollars of taxpayer money could be saved. But in order for that to happen, Paul needs to talk regularly to Fred Salvucci, who unfortunately was here but isn't here now. And I don't mean that as a criticism of this program, but what I'm saying is that not only do we day in, day out need to integrate programs, but on, or integrate work, but on programs such as this, we need all the, the players together. But let me, Mr. Hoyt? Okay. In fact, just to make the point, Paul <coughs> indeed is talking to Fred Salvucci, if you will, uh, as well as to me, and on a working level, the technical people on the uh, how a cleanup project are working uh, certainly month to month. I don't know if it's day to day, but certainly month to month with the technical people on the central lottery project. So, in fact, that is occurring. Okay. Well, what about there's one other kind of concern that, that comes up here? We've talked about Mr. Le Mr. Levy giving directions and instructions to the community how to avoid the pollution. You must be concerned about private industry. Do you have a message to send to Mr. Hessness and other private businesses about? pollution and yes. toxic chemicals? Yes. Is it just pri uh, public homes? Is, is it, it good news, Paul? Well, it's good <laughs> news for, for some. Uh, some industries have been very responsible about controlling their discharges into the sewage system. Other industries have been totally irresponsible. For example, tell us exactly what industry is doing to the water. Here. Well, there are discharge limits that each industry is allowed to, to, to dump into the sewer system, the metals content, fat contents, and so on. And uh, many industries have put into effect uh, recycling of chemicals or source reduction and so on to, to take care of that. Now, many of them have not. Um, for example, we've been fining a number, number of industries in the last few years. We actually, uh, uh, a few weeks ago, closed down a battery shop out in Framingham that was dumping battery acid down into the sewer, and in fact, until the sewer disappeared. And that's how much <laughs> acid was going down. Now, is that there. a case where they, you think they just didn't know or just ignore the... the actual harm that that uh, acid was likely to cause. They, they had to know. I mean, okay. anyone who deals with battery acid knows <laughs> what it does. It's just like the, the firm in Somerville that was dumping a half a ton per day of rendered fat down the sewer and clogging it up and saying, gee, we didn't know we were doing that. Now, they knew that it wasn't going where it was supposed to go. So we've been finding the, those firms and we've been tightening up on that. And that's a very important thing that we have to do. There have been some very responsible indices around the metropolitan area that have already done their job on that, but uh, others uh, need some work. One Are you of the really equipped to fully monitor well, the police, the private industry? We're not right now. We, one of, here's the irony, once again. Um, we've proposed a, a fairly large budget increase for this coming year, a 46% wholesale rate increase for the coming year. Part of that is to beef up our enforcement of these industries that are polluting uh, the harbor and the sewage system. If we don't do, th do that, then the, the problem will get worse. We also have a problem with dealing with the sludge that's going to be coming out of the sewage treatment plant. I'd like to make fertilizer out of it. Right now, we can't make fertilizer out of it because the pollutants going into the sewage stream 
raise the level of metals in that sludge and that compost to beyond acceptable levels. So to have a long-term solution to the sludge problem, even if we were to incinerate it, we'd want to get the toxics down, we've got to get to work on that. Now, it raises interesting questions about fee structures and so on, and one of the things we're looking at is, is actually starting to charge industries more by what they're discharging into the sewage stream rather than charging everybody the same amount. And I think that's going to be the trend as well, which also gets to Mel's point about industry paying more. If they're the ones discharging more toxics into the stream, it, it seems to make sense to charge them more. Yeah, but you just said that you were looking for a 46% increase in the wholesale rate. That's right. All right, which you're going to pass along to Boston, which Boston is going to pass along to poor folks in Boston, and Quincy is going to pass along to the poor folks in Quincy, et cetera. Uh, how do you justify that, um, that kind of expenditure uh, at this point where people are, in fact, uh, being asked to pay more and, and off the top getting nothing uh, in return uh, for it? Well, what they're getting in return is a water and sewer system that works. That's the first thing they're getting. And, and let's not forget how important that is to the health well, of a metropolitan. Well, off the top, how do they get it? How do they get it? Yeah, they, off the top. Right now, you're 46%. Get you haven't done the rest of the work that's necessary. Mel, Mel you're, you're looking at 40 years of catch-up. We no, haven't paid for it over the last 40 years. Now we've got to pay the bill. That's See, really what it's all about. A little while ago, we weren't going to go into the past, right? Now we're into it uh, again. You that's can't the, have it both that's ways. the reason for the bill. Like it or huh? not is, and I, I have a question, Mel. As an educator, I've been called upon, and all the other educators involved in this issue have been called upon to build a constituency for the harbor. Now, that means that we have to, we have the job, partly, of persuading people that it's worth paying for 40 years of catching up. And we're well meaning idealists. Are we beating our head on the wall? What hope is there of getting these people aboard? Well, let's start with uh, your last word, the board, all right? And um, <laughs> uh, let's, let's ask what, <laughs> what the makeup of uh, this board is and whether, in fact, it uh, is representative of, um, uh, of people and a cross-section of people so that um, they, the people, can have some sense that their interests are going to be served and represented uh, at that level. So let's start there, then we can move to the next level. Okay, let me discuss the, the, the constitution of the board as the legislature set it up. I think it's one of the more broadly representative boards of directors that mm -hmm. a public authority has. The governor has three appointees, one of whom has to represent the Connecticut River Valley, since that's where the water comes from, another one representing the Merrimack River Valley, and, and Jamie Hoyt, as Secretary of Environmental Affairs, is, is uh, the chairman of the board. The, the town of Winthrop gets one appointment to the board of directors. The city of Quincy gets one appointment. The mayor of Boston gets to appoint three members of the board. And the advisory board that represents all of the cities and towns that we serve gets to appoint three members. That advisory board also gets to review the budgets that the, the board of directors uh, um, proposes. So I think it's a broadly representative board, much more than the Turnpike, say, or the Port Authority, or, or, or the many other authorities that exist in the state. And, mm -hmm. and if, if ever a board existed that was sensitive to the ratepayers, you have it there. Well, well Ms. Downey, well, are the, the uh, members appointed by the mayor representative of the city of Boston? Um, I definitely believe so. I happen to be one of them, and I've been a resident <laughs> of the city all my life. Um, but um, the two other gentlemen who uh, were appointed by the mayor, one um, is a gentleman by the name of Walter Ryan who represents the labor um, part of the city, and um, Bob Siolik, um, who is a budget uh, director, is the uh, third representative of the city, and he is also the chair of our finance committee and has a very tight rein um, on what we do, as Paul knows well. Well, let me just uh, push the rest of the point. Uh, um, so the three people from Boston are white, right? Yes. There's a requirement in the statute that yes. one of the gubernatorial appointments be a minority as well. Um, and that's uh, the... In this case, it's me. Yeah, but that doesn't, uh, <laughs> um, that doesn't get to the kind of constituency uh, building. You're talking about um, uh, uh, trying to get people to come. They look at the board, um, and they see it's... Um, uh, what it looks like, and they say, well, they're not really 
uh, representing me and to talk about a tokenism approach, you know, with all due respect when you're talking about it uh, from some kind, of, uh, some kind of, of numbers. So it seems to me that uh, that's a piece of business that uh, needs to be corrected. There are people, uh, Asian, Latino, uh, in the city who uh, want to be included in this process and you need to find a way uh, to deal with uh, that cross-section of people. And I don't think when you make the statement that it is a cross-section of people that you can be serious if it does exclude uh, a good number of the people uh, in, in this city. Uh, so if you want to get to talk about the second piece, it seems to me that the visible statement that you made, the political statement that you make with a board that looks like that makes it awfully difficult to convince people that uh, there's a seriousness about their interest and their needs. Now, what's the social policy impact of, of the board? I mean, really, this is a housekeeping function, and the wholesale cost is a reflection of the design, cost of construction, and everything of the various parts that go into this cleanup. Uh, I think what you're addressing really is the question of the retail cost and how that is apportioned amongst the various classes of, uh, of residents and users within a given city or town. But and there's a direct relationship between what you pay wholesale and what I have to pay retail. Yeah, but, 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 but wholesale is, is, is kind of a pure cost. It's the cost of the system. There's nothing artificial there. There's nothing you can do, whether you're black, well, white, or in between, as to well, how that cost comes out. Well, I don't know about that. Out. If I was on the board, I'd raise some questions about the fact that he said it needed more money to go after you in order to get you to, uh, you to, you to pay, uh, because that's what he said he wanted the 46%. Uh, increase for. And that's what I meant by the fact that it's not getting to deal with the issue of the service for the people. And they're asked to pay more. Yeah, for let me it. raise another question about the service for the people. You're going to be moving tons and tons of dirt and sludge, I assume, dirt to uh, get to the harbor. What impact is that going to have on the communities here? Well, in that respect, Before we're, we get to the slug. we're a lot luckier than the Central Artery Project. Most of the dirt we're going to move on Deer Island, well, all of the dirt we're going to move on Deer Island, we're going to keep on Deer Island. We're reconfiguring the island. There's a big hill in the middle right now. We're building a barrier around the island, the island for noise and visual protection for the town of Winthrop and for um, this, uh, that neighborhood. So that dirt stays there. The other dirt that we dig up is from our tunnels, and we're doing deep rock tunnels. We're not doing dredging like Freddie is on, on, the, on the Third Harbor Tunnel project. We're going down 300 feet and going through bedrock. We will produce a very fine quality crushed stone, which in fact we may be able to sell or give away, maybe sell depending on whose budget is doing better at that <laughs> point, um, to uh, Fred and his group when they're building the central artery. So we don't have as much of a problem as he does. On but you need equipment, you need workers, <coughs> the workers you need materials. The workers, um, once again, uh, you know, Deer Island is at the tip of the, the town of Winthrop. You can't have 200 trucks a day and workers going through Winthrop across one two-lane road. So the workers and the materials are going to be barged and ferried to Deer Island. We have two staging areas, one in Quincy, one in Charlestown. That's where the materials are coming from, about two-thirds of it from Quincy. The workers are going to be ferried from all different points along the coast, uh, from Quincy, Hingham, uh, North Station. Um, and um, uh, our hope is, in fact, to get those workers who are going to Deer Island out of the center city as far as having to arrive at a pier so that they don't get involved in the, in the downtown traffic. Does that mean thousands of jobs as well for Boston residents? Uh, it means thousands of jobs for the metropolitan area. Now, not only Boston, but for example, we have already made commitments to Winthrop and Quincy as the two most affected communities because of our operations to, to concentrate job fairs and so on in those areas. One of the things we haven't done yet, which we need to do, and I think Fred's a little bit ahead of us on this, is to actually figure out what skills we're going to need over the next 10 or 12 years in building this plant and then in operating the plant. And then we have to tie into what Al Rain is doing with the governor's office, get back to those training programs and the Votex schools and, and whatever to, uh, to make sure those, uh, those people are trained. Is there some fear that you have to go outside of the Massachusetts community to I, get some of the uh, I, I certainly hope not. Workers? If, if there was ever a time for opportunity for all, this is it. Between our project and 
and the Central Artery Project, if, if, if you're able-bodied and living within 10 miles of, of, uh, of the coast, you should be able to get a job. So if Mr. Salvucci's number is busy, we can call you. That's right. <laughs> right. They're, they're right. calling already. You know, there's a very interesting uh, point that you make. Um, you've made a commitment to the folks uh, uh, in Winthrop uh, and Quincy. And um, where's the prison? The, around? the prison is off of Winthrop, that's right. Winthrop, so are you saying that those folks would have a priority uh, call on jobs and training who are in that prison right now? Because it seems to me that if you do that, <laughs> that would you know, make a big difference in their outlook and in their, uh, and in their lives. We are not legally allowed to give someone a priority like that when we're hiring, but we can... We'll give them a commitment like you're giving the other folks. No, we're, we're, give, we're going to give a commitment. We're also negotiating with Charlestown right now a mitigation agreement. And let me, let me t say in these mitigation agreements, these are signed contracts with the communities. These are not informal arrangements. These are item by item financial commitments to those communities and, and, and social commitments to those communities. And we're talking to Charlestown now in East Boston about the exact same thing. Are you going to talk to Roxbury? We're not planning to put a sludge treatment plant in Roxbury. We're not uh -huh. planning to put a pier in Roxbury. Are you going to put a sludge treatment place in East Boston? And, no, no, no. Uh, we, we, the sites for, that we're looking at for sludge are, include Quincy and include some other, uh, but n nothing in Boston other than Spectacle Island. Does that mean that a community would have to agree to have a sludge treatment plant in order to be assured a certain number of jobs? We haven't found a community yet that's really <laughs> enthusiastic <laughs> about that. You know, we, uh, I was at a public hearing once and, and someone uh, said, we don't want this sludge that you folks at the MWRA produce in our community. And, and it, it sort of stopped me cold and I said, we, we don't produce any sludge. We, we collect what you all produce. And, 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 uh, but, but we, uh, we asked for volunteers. Uh, we didn't find any, which means we'll have to pick a site. And it probably means unless we have a willing seller that we'll have to go back to the legislature and ask for eminent domain authority to, to take that land. Representative Hayes, the legislature is talking about that, aren't they? Isn't there some support for that notion? Well, I don't know if there's any support at this point. Um, we have given the authority just last year the access uh, ability that they need. They, they found themselves in a situation where they were looking at 12 sites. Seven of those sites were private. Five of those sites were public. They had access to five of them, but weren't able to go out on the public sites and really do the environmental testing and the analysis necessary to say whether or not it was a viable site. And the legislature uh, recognized that. We gave them the authority and said, go on, do your, do your job and come back to us if you need uh, additional uh, authority. I think that we're going to look very carefully, though, uh, at, at, at that issue because we want to make sure that it's being done in an environmentally safe uh, manner. And that's what the access was all about. Okay. Charles? Yes. Uh, it, it seems to me there's another point that we're, we haven't touched on yet, but it grows out of our discussion earlier about the artery, and that is how are we going to ensure, let's assume that this whole package comes together and somebody pays for it, and uh, we try to deal with the uh, inequities of that payment, um, and we come out at the end with a sword system that works, uh, how do we avoid consuming and exceeding the capacity of that system instantly? The day Paul Levy cuts the ribbon, just as just about the same time Fred Salvucci's cutting the ribbon, we find too many cars on our artery and too much storage in our plant. Uh, the reason we're in this bind right now, it's very similar to the discussion we had earlier about traffic. We're in this bind because we did not plan for the kind of growth and the kind of load that the system is, uh, un is undergoing. And we are not yet really planning, not, it's not Paul's fault, but there is still a lack of control over the continued growth and the continued inputs into that system. Uh, and I'm interested in hearing people's thoughts on how we're going to prevent uh, Paul's plant from being overwhelmed the first day it's opened. I'd, I'd like to Sir, follow up on one thing that Doug has said, which I think, I think his point is absolutely uh, uh, accurate. We've been talking about a sewage system, but this also is another kind of system. It's a water system. Every gallon of sewage that we dump into the harbor is 99.99% pure water. And we dump a lot of that in the harbor. If you took the entire volume of the Mystic River, the Charles River, and the Neponset River, that equals the volume of sewage we're putting into Boston Harbor on a daily basis. The, the volume of those rivers and the volume of the sewer is the same. This, is, this connects to Mel's problem uh, because Part of the cost of this is handling the enormous volume of the system. If we continue to do this, uh, we are going to have an obsolete system before it's finished. 
Uh, we have to get into conservation in a major way, and we have to realize that, again, just as I made a, a case that the federal government had a reason to get in on, on funding this, one of the reasons this state should seriously consider funding through Emmett's bill, uh, this system, is because it has regional impacts in western Massachusetts and in central Massachusetts. That water that comes to this system comes from the Quabbin. It comes from those watersheds out there. And so just, it's not just the 43 communities that are affected. We're talking about a much broader area. We're talking right? about the entire state, really. And as we collect that water, if we don't get better at using it, we're not going to just spend $6 billion to build a sewage treatment plant. We're going to spend billions more to rob the, uh, the Plymouth Aquifer, to divert the Connecticut River or the Mystic River. There's an ethics here that has to be addressed. We live in a finite universe, and we have to use our resources in a way we've never used them effectively before. If we do that, if the state recognizes its interests and jumps in to reduce the rates, I can't understand how, how poor folks in the city of Boston are going to pay this regressive funding mechanism, or through this regressive funding mechanism, this tax. The state has an interest as much as the federal government. We have to get into it. The impacts are statewide. They're water and they're sewer connected. Well, can and we do something immediately? Uh, Mr. Rain and Ms. Downey, can the governor and the mayor agree to have public service announcements telling the public how much damage we're doing to the sewer system? Can we s send out handbills? There must be something the city and the state can do yeah, to let the citizens know about this problem. Well, Paul's doing a great deal of public education. Let me, let me give you my thoughts, though, on, on, on what people need to know. Um, I think on the sewer system, uh, there's very little an individual citizen does to, to you know, other than produce his or her normal volume of, of toilet flushings and baths and showers and, you know, and, you know, watered lawns and everything else. There's very little the individual citizen does to contribute to the physical deterioration of the sewer system. The individual citizen doesn't conserve enough water. Industries very often put things into that system, as Paul was describing before, that physically harm the system. I think on the sewer side of this thing, we've got to do Paul's project, and we have to get much better about water conservation. That's the answer, though, on the citizen side for both systems. And Bill's absolutely right. We have to make a commitment to water conservation. One thing, as a matter of state policy, the governor has said, and I think almost everyone agrees with him, as a matter of state policy, we should never divert the Connecticut River or the Merrimack River to add to the MWRA water supply. Well, we should, is, is there we more, just shouldn't do it. Is there more and that's a, a fundamental th limit. Was there more of a concern for citizens, though? If I, clean, if I wax my car this spring, and then wash the solution off into the drain. Will that affect the system? Mr. Yeah, Levin? Ch Charles, it depends where you live. If you live in certain Cambridge, yes. So okay. If I decide, as I do every year, spring cleaning, take out the old bottles of um, whatever's left over from last year and pour it into the drain, rather than putting flammable liquids into the trash dumpster, is that going to influence the harbor? Yeah, that's a real problem, and, and um, I take it back. You can do a lot of damage. And if I decide, if I decide <laughs> and to, you better stop right if now. If I decide to paint my house every three years and then wash the uh, debris down, is that going to affect the harbor? Yes, and in fact, there are even some standard household chemicals and drain clearers, for example. That or things used for gardens. That's right. Chemicals for gardens. And, and, uh, and Lorraine may want to address this. She's done more work on it uh, through the city than... Than, than I have as yet, but there are things that we need to do in terms of household hazardous waste as well. Or cleaning my, uh, changing my oil. Yeah. It's another problem, we, right? I, uh, the, the answer to this whole thing is education, and that's what we all have to do. Um, we have to educate everybody. Um, I find it very interesting because it's very, very easy to get the little kids in the schools and educate them to the harbor and how important it is to clean it up and, and be outraged about what we've done. It's much harder to educate the older people. We're, um, we're, doing, um, we're trying to put together a household hazardous waste pilot program in three neighborhoods in the city of Boston. Um, they will, it'll be in May and June uh, with the help of the state through some f f pilot funds that they've made available. Um, none of those pilot funds can be used for the education piece. It doesn't do us any good to go out there and have this one-time Saturday pickup in a neighborhood unless we give them something that says, don't buy this stuff anymore. Okay, use this instead. Well, can't you and, do that? Can't you well, that's what we're trying to do draft right a flyer now. That's we've the got do's it. and don'ts. Of we've, a... we've got that, and okay. that's part of the program. And I'm trying to work with the MWRA actually to get them to publish it to send out to all of our um, 
households. How basically. soon are we talking? Can you do that, Mr. Levy? Yeah. Can we get it done before the weather gets better? Oh, we'll get it done in time for, for her program. Now, for the car cleaning and the gardening right. and the and, painting? And then the cost of that will be included in the rates that our ratepayers see. Right. Now, I think that's a legitimate cost. There may be others who disagree. Others might say, well, that should be funded out of the state budget. I say we can't afford to wait for that. If the legislature hasn't created a program that will fully fund those, those, uh, those projects, uh, but it's affecting the sewerage system and affecting people's habits, we, we need to go ahead and do it. If, I'm, if, I'm, if I work for a major industrial concern in and around Boston, and I think that that concern might be adding toxic uh, pollutants into the water system, can I safely report that without the fear of losing my job? And if so, how do I do it? If you report to us that you're exceeding the discharge limits, but you have a plan for... I'm an employee. I'm not... I just employee. happen to... Okay. I'm an employee. I happen to know that uh, this... We, we would you can come good to us. The we'll be glad to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> Call Mr. Four. You'll yeah, take care of it. We'll be glad to hear from you. Without yes. my risking losing the job? Sure. And it seems to me that one of the things that is important is that we are going to have to really get a handle on the legal discharges. I know Paul is working on it. It's a very difficult and complicated problem because you have thousands and thousands of these. Uh, it's important for people to understand that these discharges are costing everyone. They're costing the people that Mel, are, Mel is concerned about, uh, the people who can't afford to pay for this system as it is. Uh, and every time we get the illegal discharges, it worsens the situation. It seems to me there's another question that, um, because I'm, uh, I think Mel has put his finger on a very difficult problem of paying the freight for this. Um, in the long run, once we finish this system, and if we get all the industrial discharges cleaned up and everything else, the next growth in sewerage discharge can't go into Boston Harbor. The next one is going to go somewhere else. And the other thing that people have got to start understanding is that the Framinghams of the world the outlying suburbs that are part of the system are part of the cause of this pollution, part of the reason that the people in the city of Boston are faced with such a tremendous bill to pay for fixing it. The next time we build a sewerage plant for Framingham, it should be in Framingham. Um, the next one we build for Wilmington or Stoughton should be in Stoughton or Wilmington. That's something that people are going to have to start facing soon because it's going to affect the kind of growth they're going to have in those outlying towns. And, and it's going to save Mel's people money. Let me just say that um, I think they're really three elements. There's certainly the issue of uh, conservation generally that we talked about, and Paul and Al and Lorraine talked about, in terms of its effect on the system and the opportunities for really um, <coughs> taking a lot of water out of the system. But also, the, everybody should know that the board of the Water Resources Authority <coughs> voted at the time it made its siting decision with respect to a secondary treatment plant at Dare Island, voted that any growth in the system had to be accommodated through satellite treatment plants that uh, mm -hmm. Doug mm -hmm. referred to. And then also, another way in which we can affect this process is that through, again, the environmental review process, we have the opportunity that any project that requires a state permit that's going to add flow to the system, in fact, has to take out twice as much flow from what it added. Mm -hmm. So uh, those, I think, are other elements. Jenny, is there a rule of scale as to, uh, in, in other words, you're basically saying we'll take care of the 43 towns at some hypothetical maximum capacity level, and if on the fringes there is an excess to that, then they've got to start looking at, uh, at separate treatment systems. I've, I've always heard a traditional wisdom that the, the small systems, they don't work that well, and there's a, there's a great scale to be uh, achieved and earned in these large ecosystems. But is, is, the, is, the, is the MWRA at kind of the outer limits of... Uh, well, one of the things that let me just let me be clear on, because the whole Assembly. issue of uh, small-scale treatment plants and package treatment plants poses another set of problems, which uh, you know we're concerned about, and we're in the, involved with a broad-scale group right now taking a look at the implications of that. I think the technology is there for uh, such small treatment plants. The question becomes to what extent, again, depending upon what they use for, they in fact induce the growth that may be might not be healthy in all Yeah, instances. exactly. Jamie and Lorraine, I mean, obviously education is important, changing people's habits is important, but the discussion we're having right now about satellite plants implies that growth can just continue without planning, without putting some kind of lid and control on it. It doesn't mean that growth is bad, but just that we have to manage it. Is there a plan for sustainable growth in the state of Massachusetts? Let me just add one other thing, though. It also implies that growth means that there's more sewage. 
which doesn't necessarily have it to happen. It doesn't necessarily yeah. have mm -hmm. to be. Like, for example, we just got the state plumbing board to change the standard for toilets. We, they're going to be using half as much water each. People are going to put in flow restrictor shower heads. Industry is going to be putting in more water efficient systems, more sewage efficient systems. I believe that the capacity of that plant at Deer Island is going to last well beyond the design life because I think we're going to have so much water conservation and we're going to fix the sewer pipes so they don't leak in when it rains, which is what they do now, <laughs> that there's going to be capacity out there for, for a long, long time. But so the we key is that the towns... We'll have to face the, uh, the satellite plants in the foreseeable future. As long as the towns do the job. I mean, the key is going to be that the towns are going to have to make those investments um, the MWRA can certainly help them, but they're going to have to get out there and get those flow restrictions down. The rates are going to have to be set in such a way, and I know that they're trying to set them that way, so that they, the towns are induced to do that. If I'm Framingham, I don't want to have my sewage discharge grow because I don't want to have to build that satellite, satellite treatment plant. I know I'm not going to be able to send anything more to Boston because the system is going to have a maximum lid on what I'm going to get out there. And so from that point on, I better be installing mm -hmm. those shower restrictors, those flow restrictors, and those new toilets, and the whole works. Because I've got to have the same amount of water going out. What about the Mr. Souls? The, the outlying communities prepared to respond to this challenge? I, th I think we need to take a look at the, what the law says that, that communities can do. And, and the, the ability for communities to control some of this growth is very much restricted by federal law. Developers can come in and basically uh, set a lot of the standards in the existing zoning right now in communities would allow a build-out that would really overwhelm every system that's being built right now. And I think we need comprehensive long-range planning. That's what our agency is all about. It's what we've been doing for 25 years. But we have no ability to tell anybody to do anything. And that's what's missing in the system right now, is who is going to say and who's going to set those standards and who's going to do that? Are we going to ask the legislature to do it, the governor, the cities and towns? Or is it, in fact, the partnership that I think we need to, to make that happen? The, the long-range planning has to take place at every level of government. It has to take place at the local level at the state level and God forbid at some point at the, at the, at the federal level. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But at right now it's not happening. Local communities aren't planning and we've heard tonight time and time over time and time again that the state isn't planning, the city isn't planning for growth. We've seen a city that's, that's grown like Topsy. If the current course continues we'll wake up a decade hence and find ourselves in the middle of Manhattan. It will be gridlocked by traffic, and the harbor will be, still be a cesspool. And there's a reason And we for simply that. can't allow that, that to happen. We need to start a planning process now. The reason we don't have that planning process, the reason we don't have this vision, is because we don't have a constituency for planning, and we don't have a constituency for Boston Harbor. Uh, Paul and I belong to an organization called Save the Harbor, Save the Bay. We're trying to involve citizens into their most important role one of their roles is to take the toxics out of their house. Another is to conserve water. But another one is to realize that they are political individuals that are going to ultimately determine the success or failure of this whole enterprise. We need what Ian Menzies calls an intelligent but barely restrained mob out there <laughs> uh, asking that this be done, but that it be done cost effectively that the, uh, the fees are not put on the poorest and the least able to handle them, and that we have some vision, that we have a plan, and that we don't end up doing what we've done all throughout history with this problem. We started out dumping in the back bay until we had the great cholera epidemics of the 1800s. Then we moved the problem out to Dorchester Bay until we polluted Dorchester <laughs> Bay, then to Quincy Bay, then to the Outer Harbor, and we're dangerously close to simply exporting the death of Boston Harbor out into Massachusetts Bay and, and endangering Georgia's banks. If we don't do that. If we're not going to do that, we need the individual to stand up and realize that the individual has a responsibility. Well, why should your organization and Mr. Foy's organization have to take the lead in this? I mean, the mayor and the governor certainly are committed to ending this problem of pollution and toxic waste. Can't there be a coordinated effort by these entities to sit down and say, this is a specific plan? It sounds like you have a plan. You have a, a, a proposal that's effective, that's reaching the community, and you need the support and the endorsement of the mayor and the governor to make it effective. I think there's a fear of uh, facing up to the political realities of the cost and how that's going to be apportioned. Well, I, I think would, the real fear is that both the city I, and the I would disagree level? with that. I, I would disagree with that. I, I w you have to look at what this administration has committed for funds in this area. One of the problems with this system is it has so many holes in it. Never mind the illegal discharges, it's the unwanted groundwater that's seeping into the system. We have an aggressive program, a $100 million bond issue passed by this administration to correct that, and we're going to reauthorize that. 
Uh, we passed back in 1985 one of the largest bond issues to deal with, with this issue in the history of the Commonwealth. So this administration has been responsive in this area. It now requires, though, because the federal government has clearly stepped out for a five-year period. They have given us a five-year period where they've told us what they're going to give us, and then they said the program will end at that time. I suggest, and that's what the bill will do, that we maximize those federal dollars, limited as they may be, with an aggressive state program for a five-year period. And then let's see what the CSO price tag is going to be from them, because we're going to have to deal with that down the road. Let's see what the federal government has done about reactivating. I, I, I would argue with Al Rain that they will come back to the table because the National Leagues of Cities and Towns estimate that 1990 there will be $100 billion worth of similar work required across the nation. And the, and the rate payers in San Diego and Florida, they're going to be faced with the same problem that we're grappling with right now. I believe the federal government will come back at some point in the future. We can't assume that. Let's do a program on the state level that gives Paul Levy the tools that he needs in the short run and see what happens in the federal. Representative, Mr. Levy, count, you, count on the long run, though, I hope. Well, Mr. Levy, assume you're successful in cleaning the harbor, the great goal in the next decade. What about all this sludge? What are you actually going to do with it? The sludge, <clears throat> we hope to make into fertilizer, basically to recycle. The, uh, now, uh, let me get back Sounds to... Sounds impressive, but unrealistic. No, no, no. Milwaukee, you're going to make fertilizer Milwaukee's, and then do what? Milwaukee's been recycling fertilizer uh, sludge for 60 years. In fact, they can't get enough of it to the market. So do we have a contract with Milwaukee? No, we're not going to ship it all the way to Milwaukee. <laughs> all right. Do we have a contract with Ohio? Do we no, have no, a contract no. with New there York? There are plenty of markets here, and we're going to be making fertilizer. You can use it on on parkland, on golf courses, state forests, uh, all those those things, and there'll be plenty of place to put it, assuming we can get the toxics down and and and, um, and, and fix that problem. But l let me get back to the point that was raised before. We're fixing the sewer system. An end result, a, a, a byproduct of that is the harbor will be cleaner. We're not saying the harbor will be clean. There's still stuff down at the bottom of the harbor. We're not going to dredge the harbor in this project. We're going to fix the pipes going into the harbor. And someday, as Dr. Kaufman was saying, we've got to decide how important that stuff is down at the bottom and what, if anything, we're going to do about that. Well, someday, will, will we be able to catch the fish and eat them? The, uh, the goal of the federal law is swimmable, fishable. And swim. And fishable. Yeah. Charles, you, what we need is coordinated leadership, and leadership at, at all levels of government. For, for example, piers and staging is a problem. We still don't have a lease yes, for it. I haven't seen it, a signed lease. <laughs> Al Rain told me I was going to see it in October, and I haven't seen it yet. And win. somebody ought to lock Dave Davis and Paul Levy in a room and Mike, not let them out until they board, sign that board document. Board today, Mike. It's Mike, in the mail. Uh, Mike, they've been locked the in the room. Yes, they've so been locked thought, in the yes. room. The coordination is strong. I told you you'd have a deal in October, and you have it. And Dave Davis and Paul Levy and Fred Salvucci and Jamie Hoyt spend more time locked in a room together coordinating <laughs> these projects than you can imagine. Well, it's obvious that we can go on all night discussing this, but I'm very pleased with the uh, candid and frank way in which our panelists have talked about the issues facing the cleanup of Boston Harbor. I think we've made a lot of a progress, at least identifying the issues. Hopefully, we can come up with some sensible solutions. We thank you for joining us tonight and hope you enjoyed the program. Good night.